What's up, everybody? It's Tuesday, so it's time to get tactical. How's it going? I, was, uh, I wasn't entirely sure what I was going to talk about today. Uh, we were going to maybe go over some Yanari stuff, some Harlequins. I played some games over the weekend, but the tournament I played in um, I, you know, it wasn't that great. I didn't have a, uh, My games weren't that great, so I wasn't going to talk about that. And then literally, like, 12 hours ago, this huge leak dropped with, allegedly, all of the 9th edition Tyranid rules in it. And my uh, question was answered. What am, what am I going to talk about today? We're going to have to talk about this sick Tyranids Codex. How's it going, everybody, in chat? Hope everyone's having a good Tactical Tuesday. And uh, let's get freaking right into it. We're going to be doing a holistic view of the entirety of the Codex. We're going to talk about everything in here um, from the special rules all the way down to the data sheets. I did do kind of a first impressions live stream over on Twitch. If you're interested in more of that, you can go check that out over on the Twitch channel. It's twitch.tv slash Uh That's available for, uh, available for subscribers right now. And that was a little bit more loosey-goosey. We didn't really have a structure to that one. We just mostly just talked about stuff. But this, uh, this one's definitely going to be a little bit more structured. So if you want to... Um, if you if you just want to get an overview of what what it's in this book, this is gonna be uh, this is gonna be the way to do it, I think. Um, as some people are finding out, uh, I have a couple commands set in here for uh, the supplements: exclamation point crusher, exclamation point leviathan. Um, is uh, what you can put in there if you ever want to ask whether or not Crusher or Leviathan supplements will be available for this codex. And uh, there's an answer for you from the Stream Elements bot. So thanks, Stream Elements bot, for saving me a lot of time and energy. We're just not going to be talking about that right now. Uh, we're going to be moving forward, assuming that Crusher and Leviathan are not legal. There's a likelihood that they are, and if they are, this codex is even better than it looks like. Uh, if they're not, that's also fine too. I think there's a, there's at least enough to get your you know scything talent stuck into with this codex that uh, additional supplements probably aren't required. Um, I don't think it's like broken or anything. I think the, the codex is actually probably pretty well balanced in the power curve standpoint, at least from my first impressions. But uh, if you add any additional supplements on top of that, it might spike up pretty high. We'll have to see, but I have no idea. All right, chat. Let's get it going. Um, now, we have some really interesting stuff in here. So, so first off, uh, the way that Tyranid subfactions work in this book is uh, significantly different. Well, I guess before we get into it, I know that there are some people talking about whether or not this is a, um, a hoax, a big April Fool's uh, joke. I think that uh, it, it's, it's unlikely, <laughs> for sure. Um, it's certainly formulated like a codex. As we can see, we have, you know, we have art, we have uh, all sorts of uh, formatting and um, photo editing. And, you know, creating a Warhammer community article in Photoshop is one thing, but creating the entirety of a codex in Photoshop is a much greater undertaking. And I think it's highly unlikely that somebody would have done that for a prank. Obviously, there is still the the, the chance that that did happen. It should, you know, could have happened. Everybody can buy Photoshop if they want to. Um, and... As well, uh, you know, take everything you see on the internet with a grain of salt. But I think at the very least, this is going to uh, resemble how Tyranids will look in the 9th edition codex. Um, so whether or not that turns you off uh, or not, I don't know. We are still probably at least three weeks out of the codex release proper. So regardless of the fact that we do have this document, and it may be a prior version of the document or slightly outdated, uh, we are still going to have to wait a couple weeks to get the you know proper confirmation. But... I would move forward assuming that this is the correct codex, chat. I can't give you, you know, my assurance that that is the case, but this friggin' this looks like a codex. If you're looking at this codex, it, it's got all the parts of a codex, and it has, like, 60 pages in it. So <laughs> I think uh, it's, it's pretty pretty likely, though, <laughs> nobody built this in their basement. Um, all right, anyway, let's talk about it. Now, we have here, uh, this is, these are rules for High Fleet Adaptations. So these are the sub-faction abilities that Tyranids have access to. And they work differently than any other sub-faction in 40k, which is very cool. So let's talk about it real quick. We can see we have an example of a High Fleet here. This is the High Fleet Behemoth rules. And they have essentially three components to their sub-faction ability. So we have our, our normal Warlord trade, Psychic Powers, Stratagems, uh, Relics, everything that a normal sub-faction would give you. Then... Our sub-faction ability has a High Fleet Adaptation, which is the, uh, you know, special ability that your entire army gets access to. In addition, you have an Adaptive ability, and that Adaptive ability can be uh, broken down into one Biomorphology from uh, one of two different subsets. 
There are three types of biomorphologies. There's hunt, lurk, and feed. Different hive fleets have access to different versions of them. And when you choose to use one, you can swap, uh, swap out your adaptive uh, sub-faction ability for any of the abilities in these biomorphology lists. And now if we take a look at our biomorphology lists here, we can see uh, that each of the um, subsets has a selection of five sub-faction abilities. So the other cool thing about this is that this is also chosen before the game begins, but after list construction. So after you see, you look at your opponent's list, lists are revealed, you can then choose uh, to swap out this adaptive ability for any of those 10 options that you have over in uh, the hyper adaptation uh, list of options, which is sick. So essentially every single high fleet that you pick will have one concrete set ability, then one unique ability that can be exchanged from game to game for a more generic one, which is super cool. Generally speaking, the more powerful of the abilities in this selection are going to be the ones that are unique to each high fleet, but it gives you a ton of optionality to switch out for different abilities. And I think some of the most important ones, uh, if we go look through our, our biomorphology lists here, um, we have stuff like the ability to fall back and shoot. You can just turn your army into ultramarines if you want to from game to game. Um, you can get plus one to charge. You can uh, ignore Overwatch if you're playing against Tau or something. You're really worried about Overwatch. You can get rid of that. You can uh, ignore um, penalties to your charge rolls. So if you're playing against Custodes, you can um, uh, dodge their Tanglefoot grenades. There's a, there's a, I mean, the amount of optionality in this uh, system is really impressive. And I think it's really going to make this faction one that, uh, something that I'm, you know, super excited about is that it's really going to make this faction one that practice with the faction is going to make you infinitely better at it because you're going to be able to adapt your sub faction ability to your very specific matchups and that's so cool chat this is so cool this ability is sick so anyway those are the high fleet adaptations um now it was rumored but we didn't have uh we didn't have a um uh a confirmation that hive tyrants were going to be uh, restricted to one per detachment. We can see it here now. This rare organism's ability restricts you to one Hive Tyrant for each detachment in your army. So that means for a normal game, 2,000 point game of 40k, you can only ever have three Hive Tyrants because you can have three detachments and one Hive Tyrant per detachment. Importantly, that also includes Swarm Lord because it's uh, the bold Hive Tyrant keyword. And so that includes Winged Hive Tyrants, Foot Hive Tyrants, and the Swarm Lord. They all have that Hive Tyrant keyword. Too bad, but Hive Tyrants are absolutely sick in this codex, so uh, you might be seeing two or three patrol detachments out of a lot of Tyranid lists because, oh boy, our Hive Tyrants, super duper cool. Um, the rest of these rules, just talking about some of the uh, uh, the Hive Fleet adaptations that we talked about. We also, um, importantly, have this Living Artillery keyword here, which essentially just affects the Spore Mine units, so Meotic Spore Mines and uh, regular Spore Mines. They... Uh, reinforce that those units don't gain high fleet adaptations, but they also don't break any of your sub your faction abilities. You're probably not going to be taking spore mines in your your lists proper, so um, it's just I guess a nice uh, clarification to have. This is all the rules for um, uh, warlord traits, psychic powers, all that stuff, and then we can talk about some sub factions in specific. Now we've looked at the behemoth one a little bit. Uh, it is a lot of these. Subfaction abilities, and especially the main subfaction ability, will give a stat buff. Then the uh, adaptive abilities are a little bit more, um, uh, a little bit more selective. They're a little bit more matchup dependent. So, Behemoth here, you get plus one strength first round of combat if you charge, war charge, or performed a heroic intervention. Sick. Obviously, Behemoth is all about dealing damage. We can see that exemplified in their relic as well. Plus one damage to all of your weapons. And importantly, as we talked about in our previous videos, when we talked about things like the Flying Hive Tyrant, which has both a melee weapon profile, if you elect to take it, and a Tyrant Talon profile, it gives it additional attacks. Something like this will uh, Im impact all of your different weapons, which means a Flying Hive Tyrant could potentially be swinging three damage Scything Talons and two damage um, uh, Tyrant Talons as well, which is very cool. Um, the rest of this is, uh, pretty standard. We can see essentially, uh, um, the psychic power, um, 
is still plus one to wound from uh, High Fleet Behemoth, which is great. Importantly, a lot of the Psychic Powers now key off Synaptic Link range, and uh, the Synaptic Link range is going to be, we're going to be talking about that a lot. So uh, that is, I can assure you, exactly identical to the Synaptic Links out of Warzone Octarius. So you pick something within 12 inches, or you bounce to a Synapse creature within 12, and then can then bounce to another Synapse creature or another unit. You can just bounce infinitely down the chain of Synapse creatures if you want. And a lot of Psychic Powers, Special Abilities, um, Targeted uh, buffs and things like that will all be keyed off Synaptic Link. It's actually, it's super important for the faction to keep your Synaptic Link active, and it's also very powerful. So interim units that are between your supporting characters and your frontline, or vice versa, if you're buffing your backline units with your characters who are out in the front fighting, are going to be very important. So there are going to be units like, uh, I think, Parasites of Mortrax, like uh, the Tyranid Warriors, like Zone Thropes, that are going to be able to sit in that sort of midline, and you're going to be able to send Synaptic Link abilities and Psychic Powers like this back and forth. The ch along the chain. And again, this faction is going to be very finesse oriented, and I think that sort of situational awareness is going to be a big part of it. Let's move on. We'll talk about High Fleet Kraken. Obviously, Behemoth looks great. High Fleet Kraken, uh, again, we have that stat buff in here. You get plus one AP uh, on the first round of combat, or I guess uh, specifically if you charge, and High Fleet Kraken is all about charging. They, uh, their adaptive ability gives you D3 plus three inches to your advance rolls instead of just the normal. Um, D6, so it's a little bit, uh, I guess it's slightly different than the uh, the 3D6 drop lowest for uh, advance rolls that they've had previously. Um, importantly, access to advance and charge is much more limited in this variety of the codex. And I'll, I'll rip the band-aid off now, chat. There is no double move in this codex. There's no metabolic overdrive. There's no uh, hive commander. All of that stuff is removed. Um, Overrun still exists, but in a weird, uh, a weird way. We'll talk about that later. It's it's broken right now, and it needs to get around it. Um, opportunistic advance still exists for High Fleet Kraken. Uh, it now just gives you a flat eight in, on your advance move instead of rolling. So uh, a lot of people are saying, "Oh, it's instead of advancing, you move eight inches." Uh, no, you still advance. Your advance roll is just considered to have been an eight instead of whatever else it was. It's exact. There's so so many stratagems that are ex identical to this elsewhere in the game. It's exactly like all of those. So if you if you know enhance ether sales or um, the the Eldari strat to max six inches advance, it's exactly like that. You still advance, so you cannot charge after this without being buffed from something else. Um, and you uh, you you just don't roll for the advance roll. You just go eight inches. Uh, importantly, Opportunistic Advance also uh, lets you uh, advance and fire assault weapons without penalty, which is pretty nice. So it's, it's, it's going to be um, useful, uh, most importantly, on your um, your little units, I guess, for uh, being able to get their short-range weapons into range, which is great. Um, importantly, High Fleet Kraken has the only access to CP regen in a Warlord trait or Relic. So a CP regen an upgrade for the army is only available in High Fleet Kraken, but as we'll talk about, there is a very, a much weirder way you can get CP back in uh, uh, in Tyranids right now, and uh, as befits Tyranids, I think we'll we'll talk about that a little bit later. So that might not be the only access to CP region Tyranids have, and again, if uh, High Fleet Leviathan supplement is legal, <laughs> exclamation point Leviathan in chat, if you want to hear my thoughts about that, uh, then you could potentially have access to the High Fleet Leviathan uh, relic as well. But in this case, one step ahead, this Warlord trait is the only access to that we have. Um, we also have Synaptic Lure that's basically unchanged from the previous version. It is 18 inch range now, which is a little bit uh, lower. Chameleonic Mutation is much more powerful though. It turns you into Harlequin. You're minus one to be hit and you cannot, uh, hit, hits cannot be rerolled against you, which is pretty good. Uh, moving on, we have Leviathan, and this is going to be the one that I think a lot of people are going to be playing, especially, again, if that supplement ends up being legal, this is going to be the number one that you see, because the ability that's a, that High Fleet Leviathan has is pants on head. It's ridiculous. Uh, this is also probably the most flexible of High Fleets, especially because of their psychic power. Uh, but let's talk about their High Fleet adaptation first. So... Uh, first off, their adaptive adaptation is uh, a Master Artisan's roll. So you reroll one hit roll when you're attacking. That's fine. It's totally okay. It's it's good for the big monsters, the big uh, Hive Tyrants and Exocrines and stuff like that. But the little stuff, maybe not so much. And there's going to be a lot of situations where you're going to swap that out. Especially for like Fallback and Shoot, I think is going to be a really good one um, to swap in with High Fleet Leviathan if you're taking some big backline gun, line, uh, gun units that could get t uh, tagged in melee. But what you're really taking Leviathan for is this first ability right here. This is super duper good. The, um, 
It gives you uh, essentially stalwarts on all of your non-synapse units. Importantly, this is regardless of their, um, or it, it's not, it's no longer within six inches of your synapse uh, units. It's now within synaptic link range. So again, uh, within 12 inches of any synapse creature, which is awesome. In addition, if that uh, model is a synapse creature, they get transhuman permanently, full stop. You're just transhuman on all your synapse creatures. So your warriors, stuff like that. All of that is transient, which is, <laughs> oh boy, uh, super powerful. So the stalwart effect on your little guys, that's pretty nice, especially for the toughness three guys, but transhuman on all of the larger units, the hive tyrants and the warriors and stuff like that, oof, is pretty big deal. <laughs> and I think those units are going to be um, pretty impactful. Those are some of the most powerful units in the codex. And there is a, uh, you can you can now use the upgrade to make a unit of synapse creature from um, your adaptive physiologies to make any unit of synapse creature, uh, as far as I know. And that means that you can potentially be adding this permanent transhuman effect to anything in the army. Literally anything can be transhuman in a Leviathan detachment, which is insane. Uh, I, again, uh, we talked about a little bit about the psychic power. This is also very important. And I think... Uh, I, it's a it's a huge word salad right now. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll talk about it when we talk about the synaptic imperative abilities because that's the next most important thing to talk about. And without going over those, this is sort of meaningless. Just keep in mind, this psychic power is ridiculously powerful. So we'll just we'll we'll return to this later. Um, they also have uh, their their artifact gives you an intercept, which is uh, totally fine. Um, their stratagem uh, gives you plus one AP if you're engaged with two Leviathan units. Again, totally fine. It's nice to have in the bank, but that's not really why you're playing it. Uh, but perfectly adapted, the Warlord trait did get a little bit of a, a leg up here. Um, it's still a uh, sort of Victor of the Blood game style reroll. So once per battle round, you get a reroll, hit, wound, um, damage roll, advance roll, charge roll, saving throw, and now importantly, psychic test which is very nice. Um, one thing that we're, is going to become clear as we talk about the combos available in this codex is that Tyranids may have become the most consistent psychic faction in the game. And abilities like this to get free rerolls on a, a free reroll on a psychic test once per once per game is part of that. But they also have some insane abilities to buff their own psychic power uh, uh, application, which is important because their psychic powers are going to be, I think, core to their game plan. And the psychic powers like the Hive Nexus out of Hive Leviathan is going to be part of that. Um, we have to talk about Gorgon here. Now, Gorgon is, uh, I think, is going to occupy an interesting space in kind of the meta game of um, these Tyr Tyranid Hive fleets because. The High Fleet adaptation for Gorgon is super interesting. It gives you 4 plus poison. So everything but vehicle or titanic, you always wound on a 4 plus. And importantly, that's anytime you make any attack. So you have 4 plus poison on your Devourers, your Flesh Borers, your Stinger Salvos. Literally every single weapon in the army wounds non-vehicles on a 4 plus. Sick. Now, as we've talked about before, the... Um, Basic Flesh Borer profile it has been increased to Strength 5, so this is actually a lot less relevant than you'd think it would be. But it does mean that any, uh, you know, uh, maybe other Tyranids are very popular, and especially Tyranid monsters, which I think are going to be some of the most popular units in the Codex. Um, and you can start taking enormous quantities of Flesh Borers or Devourers, and then 4 plus Poison all of them constantly with pretty solid AP values on top of that. And that's a really interesting place for this high fleet to stand. Now, some of the Devourer profiles did get nerfed and, and we may see uh, you know, the light infantry taking different loadouts, but this is probably gonna be the best high fleet to take those mass small weapons in. Uh, because again, you can four plus poison any of your high toughness opponents, which is pretty insane. You also get uh, a Salamander style reroll as your adaptive uh, ability, so reroll one wound roll. This is probably a little bit better than reroll one hit roll, um, but uh, again, you could swap that out for uh, one of the feed or lurk biomorphologies that we covered earlier. We also have uh, some ways to deal mortal wounds. So their uh, poisonous influence deals mortal wounds on uh, wound rolls of six. Their warlord trait deals mortal wounds. Um, their bio artifact is really cool. It does get plus one toughness and you double wounds for bracketing. Plus one toughness is a big deal for stuff like Turvagons who start at toughness eight and can be bumped to toughness nine with that. Um, there are some other monsters that are going to be pretty effective with that big, that high toughness characteristic. Uh, Trigon Primes, for example, are, are relatively high toughness value. They did get bumped up to toughness seven. So you can use this to go up to toughness eight and then further buff that with other abilities as well. So. Pretty good. 
Um, they also have a, a, a enhanced version of the Toxin Sacks as available, available for their uh, their stratagem. Toxin Sacks, we did talk about, uh, gives you a Gene Rot Might effect in melee. So your sixes to hit automatically wound your target. So that's pretty cool. Uh, moving on to Jormungandr. This one is, uh, I think, a, maybe a little bit less exciting. Um, they have a uh, Deep Strike, basically, as their stratagem, as you would sort of expect. Um their uh, psychic power improves your AP and their adaptation gives you cover. Um, they also have <laughs> their adaptive ability. It's probably uh, the most interesting one for matchup dependency because it halves your number of models remaining in the unit for the blast wep uh, weapon keyword. Um, so you, you are significantly worse at being blasted, but I think you'll probably still be blasted. Uh, you know, unfortunately, Yormagander, uh, in my opinion, um, I don't think it's going to be that great, which is too bad. Because, uh, I mean, I do like Jormungandr. I think I, I was a, very, a big fan of Jormungandr combo list in the past. But uh, so far, this, this, this High Fleet doesn't look particularly exciting. Um, uh, speaking of unexciting High Fleets, Kronos got <laughs> absolutely dumpstered, unfortunately. Uh, it gives you plus four inches of range to your ranged weapons now. And you get plus one AP if you're in half range. Again, that is going to be buffed by the plus four inches. So um, your 36 inch ranges will be at half range within 20 instead of 18 because your total range is going to be increased to 40 inches, and then you'll get plus one AP in there. It's all right. I don't know. Uh, unfortunately, the rest of their <laughs> abilities have been kind of uh, neutered pretty significantly. Deepest Shadow is no longer a, an automatic deny or a, a, an anti-psychic uh, spell. It now gives you um, essentially the... I don't remember what the stratagem was called in... Uh, in This is in Psychic Awakening, I think. Uh, when you fail, when you fail uh, Psychic Test, you take D3 Mortal Wounds. It's whatever. Um, within 18 inches of uh, the unit that you use it on. They can stop Psychic Test from being rerolled. The uh, Symbio Storm now just gives you plus one strength. This is probably the biggest hit in terms of the the, the, uh, the sub-faction abilities in the entirety of the Codex. Uh, High Fleet Kronos is, seems pretty bad now, unfortunately. Sad High Fleet Kronos. That said, High Fleet Hydra looking pretty sick. Um... It's very similar to the previous version. You get plus one to hit if you outnumber your opponent in melee. So if you, you know, if you're a custodian and you have five models, then you get plus one to hit against them. If they're a custodian unit with only three, for example. Vehicles and monsters count as five models, which means you often will get plus one to hit against small units or things like characters with your big monsters, which is awesome. Their adaptive trait also gives you plus one inch on your movement characteristic. This is cumulative with other movement characteristic buffs, like, as we talked about in a previous video, uh, Adrenal Glands gives you plus one movement, which means in addition to the High Fleet Hydra, you're going to get plus two. That's pretty good. We're going, we're, we're really zipping now. Uh, and you can move an additional three inches in the um, consolidation up to a maximum of nine because there are other ways to buff your consolidation as well. All very good. So I think both of these uh, abilities, pretty solid. Their stratagem for one CP gives you fully reroll wounds if, again, you outnumber your target. Sick. That's also great. Um, their relic is pretty cool. Unfortunately, it... The, the way the codexes uh, or the data sheets uh, weapon loadout specifically have uh, rolled out, it gives you full rerolls to wound with your ranged weapons, but unfortunately there aren't really any ranged weapons you want to use that on. So it sounds really good, but it ends up not being that great. Uh, they also have a regeneration warlord trait, and uh, their psychic shriek again can deal with mortal wounds when your um, uh, friendly models die. Or when your, your uh, friendly models are, are within range of your opponent, they can deal mortal wounds to them. It's all right. Uh, but I think especially you're, you're mostly here for the plus one to hit and the reroll wounds because that makes your, um, I mean, even your mid-sized units, your six to nine model units, and especially against, you know, in, in the metagame we're playing in right now, which has a ton of three model units with uh, Adeptus Custodes and uh, five model units and Har um, Eldari and Harlequins and things like that. Those are going to be outnumbered constantly by these Hydra units and uh, you're just going to murder them. The... Tyranids, while I, I don't know the Codex is particularly friendly to, you know, like, true hordes where you have hundreds of models, I do think that you typically will want to be maximizing the, your model count in your individual units with Tyranids, which really flows into what Hydra wants to be doing. So I think Hydra, while um, sort of Behemoth, Kraken, Leviathan, the big three are going to be probably the most played sub-factions, I do think if there is a sleeper pick in here, it is going to be Hydra. 
All right, let's keep going here. Uh, we do have some rules on um, how to build your, your uh, splinter high fleets, your custom high fleets. And essentially, I believe it's essentially that you, um, although unfortunately the scan of this page did not come out well. It's very small, as you can see. This is literally a uh, screenshot for ants. Um, I believe it's essentially that you pick two biomorphologies uh, from the lists here. You pick sort of a, a, uh, a founder high fleet that you'll get the, the other benefits from. And then um, you can pick one ad adaptive uh, biomorphology from here. So essentially, you're just building from these three different um, bars to build your uh, custom subfactions. I think generally the the main subfactions are going to be a little bit better because their main subfaction abilities tend to be very strong. But again, uh, if there is a combo in here, uh, and some of these abilities are pretty good, then uh, I don't know, we may see them happen. So uh, we'll go over them very quickly. And again, um, all of the subfactions have their own selection of two of these that they can they can pull from um which i think that i have noted down here so i don't necessarily have to go back and and look at um so hunt can get taken by oh i didn't note them all down just kidding uh all right so in the interest of not scrolling back and forth a million times <laughs> we'll just go over these real quickly um so hunt biomorphologies you can get uh, additional plus three inches on your consolidation moves so similarly that can you know Similar to the Hydra effect, although you would be replacing the Hydra effect with this one. Uh, so they wouldn't necessarily um, coexist. Heightened Reflexes, which I think is going to be one of the most important ones. If you're playing against something like Eldar or Custodes that is fast and gets into your backline very quickly, you can swap your uh, adaptive ability into this one, take Fallback and Shoot, and it's all good. Augmented Ferocity, plus one to charge, seems fine. Um, synaptic Goading, uh, this is a, a pretty important one as well. Um, it gives all of your endless multitude units, which is essentially your troops, uh, one wound infantry. So gargoyles, harmagons, termagants, all of those uh, have this keyword and they get a pregame move of six inches, which is uh, pretty good. Especially a unit like a hormigant can um, threat pretty far. They have a lot of uh, abilities and combo together to give them a pretty respectable threat range. And in addition to a normal move of six inches at this top, you can actually be charging into your opponent's deployment zone turn one with hormigons, which is pretty sweet. Uh, you actually, you have a very good charge in turn one into their, <laughs> into their deployment zone, to be fair, actually. Uh, it's not even like it's a, you know, a tough one. <laughs> I think you, I think you move, in, including the, the, the normal move, you move 23 inches. So you're an inch out of their deployment zone and then you charge. So you can really lock them up with uh, using that pregame move if you want to. Ambush Predators is a nice, uh, uh, another cool one as well. Everything in your army can intervene. Full stop. <laughs> Sick. Sounds good. Uh, there is also an adaptive physiology to intervene, and there's a lot of chicanery you can do with interventions. The adaptive physiology intervenes you at six inches, though, which is pretty cool. Uh, this is a uh, the in the lurk. I think actually has some of the best um, of, of these abilities, but I know Leviathan specifically can't take the lurk biomorphologies, which is very unfortunate for them because there would be a lot of good synergies there. One of which being uh, ignore AP one. Cool. That's a very good one for, you know, for example, you're playing against Tau. They got a ton of burst cannons and AFPs, and you just go ignore AP1. Like 50% of your uh, uh, AP values go, get uh, removed. It is important important to note, it is, it's not one point of AP. It is specifically AP1. So if they're AP0 and Montka up to AP1 or their base AP1 or, you know, it's a bolter in uh, Tactical Doctrine and they go to AP1, you'll ignore all that. But as soon as they bump to AP2, you get, you get host. Natural camouflage, uh, plus one uh, to your save when you're benefiting from cover. Pretty classic. This is a very important one as well. Territorial instincts. Uh, your monster models are objective secured and count as five models if you have a wounds characteristic of 10 or more. I think there are going to be a lot of monster heavy lists, chat. Even Crusher Stampede, notwithstanding, monster heavy lists are going to be sick with this codex. So keep that one in the back of your head. Giving all of your monsters objective secured. Whoa, whoa. Yeah, they're going to be insane. Um, unfailing resistance, again, double wounds for bracketing. That one seems fine. Synaptic Ganglia gives you a reroll Deny the Witch, and you increase your Psychic Power range. Again, I think this faction is going to have incredibly consistent Psychic Powers, and that is just another ability that can feed into that. For the feed biomorphologies, um, you can have sixes to wound get a Blade Artist on your ranged attacks. That's pretty good if you're trying to build for... A wide variety, a high volume of range attacks. So something like spamming devourers or despiters or even flesh borers can benefit a lot from these um, comboed abilities. Uh, Exoskeletal stabilization ignores hit modifiers when you're uh, moving or advancing and shooting or shooting into engagement. That one's a little bit less good uh, because you do have access to a lot of other ways to ignore those penalties. So I think it's just fine. 
This one, uh, <laughs> I saw a lot of people sort of upset about this one, but <laughs> I don't know if it's that good. Uh, you ignore Overwatch, and you can't be set to defend against. Uh, it's good against stuff like Tau, who are going to have really powerful Overwatches against you, but... Um, I don't know. I don't, <laughs> I don't really foresee me saying, taking that one too much. Uh, Relentless Hunger is a really cool one that I think, uh, again, doesn't see too much play, but I wish is an ability that was included on more data sheets. Uh, after you fail a charge, you can make a normal move up of, of up to three inches. And important to note, that's not towards the charge target. That can be in any direction, which means that, you know, for example, you pop out of a building, declare a charge, fail it, pop back in the building. You can just try it again next turn. Um, and I... You, uh, additionally, you can do things like, you know, try to charge onto an objective, fail the charge, or even purposefully fail a charge. You can charge somebody at 12 inches, assuming you're not going to roll the 11 to make the charge, and then just get that free move of three inches just generically. Um, again, that's an ability that I think is very cool and is uh, going to be very finesse oriented, and there's going to be some really cool ways to use that one. But fortunately, swapping out another adaptive uh, ability for it is going to be a little bit tough. And then uh, we talked about this one before. Unstoppable Swarm gives you uh, ignoring modifiers to your movements, including advances and charges. So that's pretty good. How are we feeling about that so far, chat? Before we move on. There are a few missing pages in the uh, in the codex. They've sort of people have been kind of scrounging them out as they've been uh, as they've been identified. But I think I'm missing a couple from my uh, version of the codex. I've added a couple. Those tend to be the ones that are formatted incorrectly. Um, but uh, I think I've tracked almost all of them down so far. Could you move three inches closer after failing a charge and then re-rolling? No. Um, the, the charge roll isn't failed until you've completed your re-roll. So um, you would you would not be doing that. Hmm. Anyway. Let's move on. Let's talk about some stratagems here, chat. Uh, so I, I think we'll, we'll probably gloss over a couple of these. There are a couple of them that uh, are important and there's a lot of uh, sort of generic stuff and, and relative garbage in here. Although like a lot of the more recent codexes, the, um, stratagems that they have put in are tends to be ones that are, you're going to use relatively often. There's not, a, there's not like a ton of garbage in here. They've really cleared out a bunch of the, the chaff of stratagems that are normally pretty, uh, you know, just kind of filling space. Unfortunately for us, I think Scorch Bugs is one of them. It gives you plus six inches of range to your Flesh Bores and plus one strength on them. Um, I don't know if Flesh Bores are the truth, though. So, <laughs> uh, and this is obviously a less powerful effect than a Black Hit plus one to wound like the previous version had. Unless you, you are pumping up to strength six and getting plus one to wound on a T3 or a T5 or six model. A little bit less likely. Although there's a lot of tough foot five in the uh, in in the meta game right now, so it might be helpful. But uh, it does bump to two CP if you use it on a terrain effects. Uh, so anything with the monster keyword, um, which is uh, unfortunate because the terrain effects does make a bunch of attacks with those guys. Voracious appetite makes a return though. Reroll wounds in melee with a monster. Uh, importantly, this is reroll all wounds, not just reroll failed wounds, which means that's great. Pretty good. Adrenal Surge uh, is only, it's the Adrenal Gland, gland Stratagem, so it's only usable on something that has Adrenal Glands. It gives you plus one attack. If you're a monster, it gives you plus D3 attacks instead. Uh, it costs two CP if you are a big unit, if you're 20 models or more. This is a phenomenal stratagem. One CP, uh, you know, potentially one CP for plus one attack on like an entire unit of Tyranid Warriors, for example, is awesome plus d3 attacks on uh something like a hive tyrant that's already going to be using those attacks on a big relic and benefiting from things like voracious appetite again super awesome you're going to be able to combo these stratagems together to do in absolutely insane damage pretty sweet reinforced hive node is the uh, unyielding chitin that tyranid warriors used to have but a buffed version of it it's two cp if you're a six plus model unit uh one cp if you are five or lower and it's minus one damage in any phase it's no longer just shooting it also works in melee Tyranid Warriors, and also importantly, it works on Tyranid Primes now too. Woo, so super sick. Uh, Tyranid Warriors are gonna be phenomenal in this Codex chat, so keep that one in mind because that's a, a, a very big old deal. Observer Organism is the updated version of Symbiotic Devastation that we had from um, 
the Psychic Awakening. Unfortunately for uh, poor Exocrines, uh, the Symbiotic Devastation got eroded into Oblivion because it no longer counted Exocrines as uh, doubling their number of shots. We don't have to worry about that anymore. Instead, Exocrines have a... Uh, effectively, the, the Exocrine stationary benefit ignores cover, and importantly, that includes dense cover. So this just applies that benefit. So they don't have to be worried about um, having uh, remain stationary to, to get that benefit of ignoring dense cover. But in order to ape the plus one to hit that they used to get, uh, it also now gives you exploding sixes. There are other ways to give exploding sixes to ranged attacks, which means that you could potentially have exocrines tesslaying their sixes, which is pretty sick. <laughs> I'm uh, exocrines are going to be phenomenal as we as we uh, sort of saw from the the leaked uh, uh, data sheet uh, reference card for them. Their base profile is insane, and their special abilities they don't have too many of them, but uh, are, uh, you know, similarly insane. So Exocrines, right back on the menu. I think one of the most improved units in this new codex. Uh, Indomitable Monstrosity, uh, if there if there was, uh, and, and there's going to be a couple of instances in here of that, if there are, uh, if there is evidence for Crusher Stampede being removed once this codex officially releases, this is probably one of them, because it is a 1 CP transhuman for any monster. Full stop. Uh, the current transhuman in... Uh, Crusher Stampede is 2 CP for monsters of 10 or more wounds. This one does not have a wounds cap on it. It is strictly better than the other transhuman. Obviously, it doesn't work on smaller units, so if you if Crusher Stampede is still legal, then you could use the other transhuman on your little guys. You're probably playing in High Fleet Leviathan, though, <laughs> if that's the case, and you'll already have transhuman on them, so it doesn't matter, and you'll just be able to transhuman your big monsters for 1 CP. <laughs> Insane. Insane value. Ah, it's so good. Uh, power of the Hive Mind is back. Let's you cast an additional power. Sick. Death Frenzy is a fight on death for a character. It does have the new wording where you cannot uh, use it on a um, character that has been selected to fight already, but it top brackets you. So you win some, you lose some. There's also a um, uh, adaptive physiology to use this for zero CP. Uh, it uses any of your epic deed stratagems for uh, free, but I think the intention is that you use it on the Death Frenzy, which is pretty cool. Having that in the bank for zero on your big Hive Tyrant that has a million buffs on it, it's going to be pretty good. Uh, we got some Lictor stratagems that uh, aren't particularly relevant because virtually Lictor's got uh, got the shaft in this one. Synaptic ch Channeling is back. You pick a Psyker and it knows all of the psychic powers from your entire army. Sick. <laughs> I'm so glad this strategy made it back, chat. It's one of my favorite ones, especially in the age where we're trying to do a lot of psychic actions and being able to pass powers from one psyker to another really smooths over those psychic phases where you have to be doing really awkward uh, power distribution. Um, but having like one dude in the back who's like oh, a plus one to cast and a reroll or something and you can just feed him a couple extra powers um, is super useful. Synaptic Legacy is the... Um, uh, it, it works with the psychic synaptic imperative abilities. Um, we'll talk about this later. We'll just, <laughs> just that's a whole thing. We'll talk about that momentarily. Uh, trampling charge. This is the other one that is basically uh, competing directly with Crusher Stampede. It is essentially a fixed breaking through. Um, the horned chitin keyword comes into play here, which we did see on Swarm Lord and the Hive Tyrants and things like that, and improves the effect of this uh, stratagem. It, um, if you have Horned Chitin on a 2+, plus, the uh, thing that you charged takes uh, 3 Mortal Wounds on a 5 or a 6. They take D3 plus 3. If you don't have Horned Chitin, they only take D3 Mortal Wounds instead of flat 3. And then on a 5+, plus, it becomes flat 3. So you really want to use it on those Horned Chitin guys. If you do, it's not dependent on your wounds at all. It just uh, deals between 3 and D3 plus 3 Mortals uh, automatically on something that you charged, which is very good. Um, a Parasite of Mortrax uh, has a little bit of a stratagem, which, which some people were uh, uh, speculating about, that there would be other ways to interact with the Parasite's uh, infestation ability, and this is one of them. So you can basically, um, like, Blade Vein somebody, where you move over them, they take D3 Mortal Wounds, and then you hit them with a, uh, a Parasite effect, which is uh, pretty cool. So... While you're affected by parasites, you can be removing obsec from people, which means that a parasite of more tracks could potentially be hitting multiple units with this over the course uh, with the uh, the, the uh, infested effect, because you could be um, you know bouncing over one guy, then charging somebody else, hit both of them, remove a lot of objectives secured from the table. That's pretty good. Uh, we do have some classic requisition stratagems here. Rear fight enhancements gives you a um, relic. 
Hive Predator gives you a Warlord trait on something that isn't your normal Warlord. There isn't a way to double up Warlord traits, so you can't take two on one character, for example. The only way to do that would be if the Leviathan supplement sticks around. Again, exclamation point Leviathan. I don't know if that's going to be the case. Uh, Subterranean Assault lets you... Um, uh, it lets you drop in your your uh, Trigons and, and Trigon Primes. Interestingly, not... Um, oh, and then they, they bring guys with them. Uh, it's interestingly uh, not Molochs for some reason, but I guess the Molochs would eat them when they the, the troops option that comes in with them. There are... Uh, there's a couple ways to redeploy your troops and or to for, to uh, deep strike your troops. And that's very important because one of the, uh, the Tyranid secondaries can only be completed by troops, but it is actually extremely powerful. Um, rapid regeneration got a huge glow up. Uh, it now triggers in your command phase, not just your, um, uh, not just your, the end of your movement phase like it did previously. So you can regenerate pat up through your mid bracket, for example, in order to get additional movement when you move to your movement phase, which is very helpful. Um, you get, it's only one CP as well. You get D3, uh, wins back much more useful than it, than it used to be, uh, in the past. Uh, we do have a way to redeploy lictors, eh, whatever. Uh, Overrun it is making a return. My favorite stratagem in all of Warhammer 40k. Unfortunately, it doesn't work quite right cur uh, currently. Uh, it's used at the end of the charge phase, but then replaces your consolidation move. Unfortunately, by the time you're at the end of your charge phase, you have already made all of your consolidation moves. So you can't then replace them because you've already done them. Um, it needs to... Uh, do something different <laughs> right now it's spend one cp and nothing happens uh the effect it's supposed to have is to make you do a more normal move if you're not engaged by an enemy it's a huge buff to the stratagem because a it happens at the end of the fight phase so even if you, that is not the unit to actually have killed the enemy you can still be using overrun to move them around and also it's not it's just unengaged it's not outside three inches so huge buffs to the stratagem it will be better once it's eroded to actually do something We'll see. Shard Lure is uh, an upgrade to Hunter's Drive. It's, I think, almost identical, except Hunter's Drive requires you to kill someone in the unit in order to give yourself a buff to your charge roll. Now it just requires you to hit. And there's a couple of effects like this that used to require you inflicting casualties with your ranged weapons that now only require you to score hits, which makes them much more consistent. Uh, so if you shoot something with a synapse creature and score a hit, you can use this stratagem. Anything that in your army that charges that you get uh, an additional d6 to your charge and discard one of the dice. I think building in outlets for this stratagem is going to be a big way to ensure your charges with the lack of double moves that the faction has now. Being able to make these long charges is going to be very important, and uh, building in uh, ways to be able to do that more consistently is going to be very important. Uh, Endless Swarm. I think yeah, people are excited about this one. Uh, you target your endless multitude units from your army and you regenerate D3 plus three models to it. Sick. Outside engagement range of uh, enemy units unless you're already engaged with them. Importantly, this isn't a sequential regeneration. So something like uh, reanimation protocol specifically, you return the models one at a time to the unit in question. Uh, this one returns all of them at once. And so one thing that's important to keep in mind is that when you return those models, they have to be in coherency with the initial models that are on the table because the new ones are not yet in coherency when you go to place them. So you, there's going to be some instances where people try to chain, like daisy chain this out a bunch of, uh, you know, a long distance. You technically can't do that. You can get about three extra inches of distance off the, off the unit with that, but you can't chain out like 10 inches or so with if you roll a six on uh, getting six guys back. But still pretty good uh, for getting gargoyles or termagants or even hormigants back. Um, not much to say there. You get some dudes back. Pretty sweet. Uh, importantly, I think this also, uh, you can you can use this multiple times in the same unit. So unlike the Poxwalker stratagem, um, dead walk again, which is once per unit, you can just continue to repeat this one over and over and over again, uh, which is pretty sweet. Uh, Tyrant Guard are going to be taking a lot of armies. They freak out when their tyrants die, so you can use the stratagem to buff them. Uh, I think that's sort of you know, just kind of fun. Bounding advance is an important one uh, for Hormigans specifically. It gives you an auto advance on your movement and you can advance and charge. So they can't advance and charge innately normally, but you can do this for them. And that's how you get that obscene threat range out of the deployment zone. You pregame move six inches. They have a base move of 10, which can be buffed to 11 uh, inches with an adrenal gland and potentially even 12 with Hydra. Is that? No, you would... Uh, be replacing the hydro ability. Um, so 11 inches uh, out of the 
six inch pregame move and then an additional six inches for the advance that you can then charge out of. Um, so Harmagants have this insane long alpha strike threat range if you are electing to, to push them that way. Uh, you can also buff their damage output pretty significantly. We can talk about all the combos you can do with them later. Um, Harmagants seem, they seem pretty okay. Uh, unfortunately, one thing that we will talk about is that a lot of the small Tyranids are very expensive for what they do, and they aren't significantly harder to kill than they were in the, in the previous version. Um, they are... They are harder to kill, but they aren't that much harder to kill. And whether or not that's worth the extra expenditure, I don't know yet. I just don't know. But I think if there is a an archetype of, of uh, Tyranid little little man unit that is going to be very good, it's probably going to be Hormigans, because a lot of the melee buffs can be applied to Hormigans very effectively. Um, Encircle the Prey is another very important one. Uh, one of the coolest stratagems uh, in the Codex right now. Uh, at the end of your turn, you can select a Burrower unit. So um, something like a Trigon or a Trigon Prime or a Ravener uh, or a, any flying unit, you put them into, res uh, into reserve and they deep strike it next turn. This means, if you're keeping track, Harry Dan does not need to overrun anymore to return back to the sky and then deep strike back in again. Importantly, he's also not uh, strategic reserving in when he comes back, which means uh, his, his redeploy is a little bit better. Now, it does have the wording, um, the, the uh, Taraxi verbiage, where you cannot uh, do it if you are already set up that turn, so you can bounce infinitely. Thank God they're starting to put that in. Boilerplate. But, again, there are some very powerful abilities that you are powerful actions you can do with things like gargoyles uh, in order to complete secondary objectives that you can be bouncing that unit up and down. You know, they, they run out one turn, do their action, bounce at the end of the turn, then the next turn they come in. Uh, do it again, and you can be getting massive victory points off of your your little uh, gargoyle units and stuff like that. Uh, your sp there's a uh, spore clouds will increase the range of your spore abilities by six inches. So um, that's things like the venom thrope aura, which got a huge buff. Toxicrins now also have an aura uh, similar to that, which will also be uh, um, be benefited from this. This is probably not going to be useful in every situation, but there are going to be situations where um, it does come into play, and it's going to be nice. Uh, let's see. Uh, we also have plus one to hit for flesh hooks. That's a flesh hook stratagem. Uh, there's a leadership affecting thing for the Toxicrin boys, but whatever. Who cares? Um, the Acid Maw now is now, uh, it's not a weapon anymore. It's just a, an ability uh, or a stratagem tied to a keyword. Um, you can do mortal wounds up to six for each Acid Maw you have in the unit. It's fine. Um, not super exciting. Corrosive Viscera is the Acid Blood stratagem. So again, these are all the stratagems that are keyed towards specific keywords that are on your um, on your units. Uh, you use it when you take a, a wound from something with the Acid Blood keyword. So for example, Haro Specs. Importantly, not when you're targeted. So you do, if your opponent is fast rolling, they could slow roll this to try to uh, to try to juke, juke you out, but you will know how many saves you're taking essentially. And if you've uh, uh, fast rolled your saves, which uh, you shouldn't technically shouldn't do, but <laughs> if you're not rerolling any saves, it's not the end of the world. You will know how much damage is incoming when you use the stratagem. On a four plus, you reflect that back and deal a mortal wound to them. Um, you still take the damage, but then they also take a mortal wound, up to six. Pretty good. Uh, Blinding Venom became uh, moved from the gargoyle melee weapon to a stratagem. Now uh, you cannot be rerolled against in melee, and your minus one be hit in melee. Cool. Seems good. Uh, Lastly, Pathogenic Slime gives you Gene Raw Might on your guns. This is pretty good um, on your large volume units. So stuff that has like, again, you know, Flesh Borers or Death Spitters or Devourers. We have a bunch of attacks coming out. Uh, giving them sixes to wound uh, or sixes to hit automatically. Wounding is pretty solid. It costs one less if you have Toxin Sacks, which is a little bit funky. Toxin Sacks is a melee upgrade. You don't always often have it on the units with a ranged weapon, but I don't know. It basically just gives you the toxic sack effect in your in the shooting phase instead of just the, the fight phase. Um, but you can do it for two CP on anybody, one CP if you if you already have toxin sacks equipped. It would basically be like warriors, I guess. Like a warrior that has a, a set of scything talons with toxin sacks and a gun. You could then use it for one CP on them. It's probably the biggest the best use case I can think of. But anyway. Let's move on from stratagems, and let's also silence my phone, because I forgot. What is the status with Crusher, chat? Exclamation point Crusher. There you go. <laughs> you figured it out. 
Uh, do I think there will be new Hormigot miniatures? I don't think so. No. Um, does, uh, do these strats bypass the rule that units cannot, um, units not in the field after turn three die? Yes. Uh, yes. Essentially, there are, there are two walls that your units hit and die if they're in reserve. Um, one of them affects you if you are a reinforcement. A reinforcement is a unit that started the game off the table and is then brought on. Anything that um, is that starts the game on the table and then leaves is not affected by the first wall, the, t the turn three wall. Everything is affected by the turn five wall, though. So everything will, that, that's off the table will die at the end of round five, but only things that started the game off the table and were never brought onto the table will die after round three. So if, the, if you use this on, for example, a unit of gargoyles that you deployed in your deployment zone, at the end of your first turn, you spend the CP and put them back up, they would not die after battle round three. Although this one happens immediately. So uh, you would use it on round... In your round three, you would use it. They would pop up, but because they were already on the table at some point during the game, they wouldn't be killed at the that round three thing. Uh, do we still have adaptive physiologies? We will talk about that. Yep, adaptive physiologies actually uh, are next. Here we are. Uh, so there is some weirdness with adaptive physiologies. Um, again, we got a we got a screenshot for ants with this one, so there's not a lot uh, we can take from this. I think this was bigger, and my uh, my Adobe compressed it or something. Um, there's what is we've already talked about a couple a couple typos in the uh, in the in the book so far. Um, the uh, swarming masses typo already or you know ability already does nothing. Um, because it allows you to fight when you're in rain, a longer range of enemies, but you're not actually able to target those enemies with your attacks. A big oversight. Overrun doesn't do anything. Adaptive Physiologies is the third one. Um, here are the Adaptive Physiologies. They are a chapter command style upgrade, so you, you spend CP to upgrade your guys with them uh, during your list construction. And you can do it on non-Titanic and non-characters. There is a reference document at the end of the PDF that specifies non-named character, uh, which is a question. So right now, I would assume that these cannot be used on your character units, although that may be eroded to be changed in the future or clarified or, I don't know, a version of the document with more updated rules comes out. Uh, so... Just assume for now you can't use these on your characters, although there are going to be some that you probably want to. So it is what it is. Um, now, they're they're less expansive than the previous version. That's because, you know, they're no longer a Band-Aid for a terrible old codex that was super shitty. Um, there are significantly more powerful relics and warlord traits and things like that in the codex. And you're not looking for at adaptive physiologists to try to shore up those weaknesses as much anymore. So there are a couple cool ones. Um, enraged reserves. Oh no. Oh, here we go. Uh, enraged reserves is uh, a very cool one. You uh, double wins for bracketing and you get an epic deed stratagem for free once per game. Again, I think that's meant to be used on the death surge because uh, it's two CP. It's the only two CP epic deed stratagem. Um, and if you were to use this on a high tyrant, you would get a free death surge once per game. That's freaking cool. The classic Dermic Symbiosis now gives you a four plus invulnerable save, but importantly, the uh, double wins for bracketing has been moved to the enraged reserves portion. Um, this one's going to be very good for, uh, you know, there's going to be plenty of, of um, monsters that use these, things like Exocrines. Uh, if you can use it on characters, things like Trigon Primes are going to be awesome, an awesome uh, pick for Dermic Symbiosis and even Turbidons. So. I mean, four plus and vulnerable save. Whoa! But there, and to be fair, there are a couple other ways to get four plus and vulnerable saves in the codex. This is a this is a four plus and vulnerable save heavy codex over here. Uh, hardened biology gives you plus one AP uh, against one damage attacks. That one's okay. 
uh, precognitive sensoria. I think that's a kind of a cool flex pick, especially if it is a smash character and you can take it on characters you fight first. So if your Hive Tyrant, you know, charges into an enemy army, um, punches somebody, gets punched back, survives, your opponent stays in combat with it, uh, your opponent charges it, it then basically gets to interrupt uh, for free, which is pretty cool. It also fights before enemies even when, um, or it fights simultaneously with any enemies that charge it. And if it is engaged in your own um, turn, then it will still fight first. It's a very good ability on your Smash characters. Uh, you get a six inch heroic intervention. Importantly, you can put this on anything. So you can potentially be um, seeing this on stuff like, uh, there are a couple pretty good pretty good places to put it, um, I think. Uh, I'll give you a little spoiler here. Venomthropes have a fight last effect and you can use put that on them to give them a six inch heroic intervention. Super cool. Synaptic Enhancement makes you a, a Synapse creature. So you um, can potentially be having your infantry units with that Synapse creature um, uh, be transhuman. Or I guess your, uh, I guess it, it's a single model. So it would be your um, your monsters would be would get transhuman from that. If you're in High Fleet Leviathan, obviously. Uh, Voracious Ammunition got a big update. You can be... So I guess I, I guess I misspoke there. Yeah, I guess so I guess you couldn't update your uh, upgrade your venom trips with this one because it is one model um, that would be eligible to to intervene. Uh, so I think a toxicrine then can do it because I think a toxicrine, if I remember correctly, has the same effect. Um, so it wouldn't be venom trips; it would be toxicrine, which is pretty sick. You get an armor of rust toxicrine running around. Uh, Voracious ammunition gets a big update again. That's another one of those um, ranged attack effects that only requires you to hit people. It used to require you to kill somebody with the ammunition and then would smite them for D3 mortals. Now you just hit with one attack, don't even have to do any damage, ping them for D3 mortals at, after it uh, finishes shooting. It's also importantly not at the end of the shooting phase like the old version was, so you don't have to remember to trigger it later on, which was really annoying. Uh, whip coil reflexes uh, gives you an attack of opportunity when people fall back from you. Probably not that exciting. <laughs> but the other one's pretty good. I think a lot of really cool upgrades for adaptive physiologies there. And importantly, these are all chapter command upgrades now, uh, not replacement effects to uh, your relics or warlord traits, which means that you can take a bunch of them and just spend more points. Seems good. Uh, I believe you can only have each one once, but you can have, you know, a bunch of uh, a bunch of, care of uh, monsters upgraded to have them. All right, we'll talk about warlord traits now. The basic warlord traits are not that exciting, to be honest. I think there, there's a couple good ones in here, but definitely the relics are going to be the most exciting part of the... Uh, of the character upgrade selection here, but there are a couple of pretty good ones. Um, they're mostly support effects. Adaptive biology is kind of the most straightforward. It gives you a five plus damage ignore. So again, if you have a, uh, a smash character or a character who's running out or is built to be tanky, something like a Turvagon with the, you know, the, the relics to be plus one toughness or minus one to be wounded, um, you can then stack that with a five plus damage ignore, which is pretty cool. Heightened senses is another good one for smash characters. It gives you uh, fight first and reroll hit rolls. Sick. Very nice. You don't even have to take the uh, adaptive physiology for it. Direct guidance, I think, is probably my favorite one. It's a uh, synaptic link. So you chain out your synaptic link pick. It gives you uh, the target unit plus one, importantly, core unit. So we do have core um, core support here. But I think it's been well implemented in this codex, if I'm going to be honest, chat. It gives them plus one to hit on all of their attacks, importantly. Not just ranged, not just melee. And that means that, as you'll see with a lot of these abilities, which do affect both uh, ranged and melee attacks, taking hybrid units, units with a gun and a sword, is gonna be pretty good because you'll then get double duty out of those benefits. And there are gonna be some pretty important, uh, important examples of that we'll talk about later. Synaptic Tendrils is another similar one. You get an additional use of uh, Alpha Warrior, Bio Impulses, Brute Progenitor, Vicious Insight, Warp Siphon, and Will of the Hive Mind. Those are your Synaptic Link command phase targeted abilities. So Will of the Hive Mind, for example, reroll ones to hit. You can use that two times. So you can pick two units to get reroll ones to hit. Um, I think a lot of lists aren't necessarily going to be like really hankering for those effects. I think you're going to be using one or two over the course of the turn. Um, but if you find yourself wanting extra ones, all right. Seems fine. Um, so yeah, I think yeah. I don't know. They're totally some functional warlord traits. <laughs> I don't know if I'm super. They're not. None of them like super excite me. But plus one to hit on a core unit is very good. What does excite me is the return of the infamous hive mind discipline. This has been the best discipline in 
the game, or at least the most the most straightforward discipline in the game for time immemorial. And it, I think, remains, because most of the power of this discipline has stayed exactly the same. Catalyst now only gives you a 6 plus damage ignore on a Titanic model. Otherwise, uh, it's exactly the same, but you do choose something within Synaptic Link range. So again, you can ping that out between all of your Synapse creatures. So while the base range is a little bit shorter, uh, the effective range is going to be longer, because you can ping it out across the entirety of the table if you want to. Um, the horror is a leadership affecting thing. It used to give you minus one to hit, which was pretty good, but uh, you're never going to take it now because it affects leadership, whatever. Who cares? <laughs> um, interestingly, this one, uh, you can bounce the synaptic range uh, to enemy units, or you can just pick an enemy unit within 24. So that's a, a, a little bit of a, an interesting um, decision point there. Uh, Neuroparasite is a uh, roll against toughness value uh which fire? If you have extra kites, like a cast, you might take that one, but that one's not super exciting. Onslaught, though. Ooh. Ooh. Onslaught's back. Onslaught's back, everybody. Uh, again, goes off on a six, just like it did in the previous version. You pick something within synaptic link range. You can advance and fire uh, assault weapons without penalty, move and fire heavy weapons without penalty, advance and charge in the same turn. Ooh. Yes. Uh, so in addition to the advance and charge that we have on Hormagons, we could be, or, um, we could be, uh, onslaughting anything in the army to allow it to advance and charge. So what we're going to see here for the most part is that the base movement values of a lot of things in the faction have gone up slightly. We've lost the double moving, but like I said a couple times before, your, your, uh, Psychic powers are so reliable in this faction. They are almost automatic, which means that if you are setting it up correctly and you're able to synaptic link back from your casters who are hiding in the back of the table and can't be denied because they're too far away, you can chain that up to a unit that's advancing right at the front of the army. And you can be almost guaranteed you get that advance and charge off, which means that uh, your base threat ranges are gonna be much longer than they were in, the, in, the, in this version than they were in the previous one. Uh, Paroxysm got a big change. Um, it, you, you're minus one to wound in melee now and can't overwatch or set to defend, but you no longer fight last. So minus one to wound is a pretty big deal, but it's, I think at best a side grade. Unfortunately, fight last was a pretty big deal. Um, but again, we have other access to fight last ability. So it's not the end of the world. Psychic scream, identical. There you go. <laughs> uh, it deals D3 mortal wounds and they might, if they're a psyker, they might forget a power and it goes through walls. Sick. Relics. Let's talk about some relics. The relics are uh, are pretty good. Um, we have some important, some, some very good ones. Uh, Yimgarl factors back. The uh, one thing that we'll notice is that the um, uh, may, the weapon relics have gotten a hundred times better. And I think this is one of the, the reasons that these big, huge Hive Tyrant characters are going to be super powerful in this codex because their the relic uh, support that they have is insane. Uh, the Reaper of Obliterax now automatically deals a mortal wound every time you wound your opponent. Full stop. Just it's it's like plus one damage with extra steps. It's like plus one damage, but your opponent can't save against it unless they have a, a mortal wound ignoring. Um, all right, it's only bone swords, but that means your bone sword is effectively on the worst day going from three damage to four, which is basically just like the Behemoth relic rolled into this one. In addition, your opponent cannot ignore wounds from the weapon. Uh, importantly, it's when attacks are allocated, which means that I don't believe it works on the mortal wounds it inflicts. So if they have a mortal wound ignoring, like Emperor's Chosen, um, they can't use any abilities they have, like Trajan's 5-up damage ignore, against the Reaper's main attack, but they could get a 4-plus against the mortal wound attack. It's a little bit weird like that, but... 99% of the time, mortal wounds are just better than plus one damage. Uh, what this does do is it means that it ignores damage reduction and damage limits. So this dude will just cut a Phoenix Lord in half. They don't get to reduce it. He will just straight up kill a, a uh, 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 what do you call those guys? A Catan. He will kill, you know, Dreadnoughts without worrying about their damage reduction. The, the Reaper of Obliterax dude is an absolute monster. Insano. Uh, the Maw class of Thyrax are pretty cool. It's a, um, it's a, in, importantly, not a 
weapon upgrade, so you don't replace a weapon with it, but it gives you plus one attack, you reroll your wound rolls, and you uh, can get additional attacks for killing people. So again, huge upgrade update. Um, you can put it on anybody, so you could just be punching people to death. <laughs> Resonance Barb is back. It's a little bit worse. You know an additional power instead of casting additional power, but you get plus one to your psychic tests. That's cumulative to other bonuses to psychic tests that you may or may not have, which is very important. So again, keep that in mind. We're going to have some of the most consistent psychic phases in the game. Uh, Pathogenesis is back. It gives you a reroll hit and wound uh, in addition to plus eight inches of range, almost unchanged from the psychic awakening version. Um, probably not going to be see taken in... Um, uh, in light of some of the other abilities that we have here. Uh, here's another big, huge melee weapon. Buff Sides of Tyran. They're a, a, monster, a set of monster siding talons. Plus two strength, AP4 for three flat damage. You make it two additional attacks with the weapon, and it replaces two siding talons, which means that uh, a Hive Tyrant makes the same number of attacks with a single set of siding talons it has. So, for example, it's a Flying Hive Tyrant. It would get plus two attacks for having two Scything Talons. You replace them both with the size of Tyran. It's now Strength 9, AP4, 3 damage, and then still gets its two additional attacks from its um, little Tyrant Talons. So it's making seven attacks at the three damage profile, two more attacks at the one damage profile. You can be potentially, if you're taking Heightened Senses with that guy and you're using Voracious Appetite on him, rerolling all of your hits and all of your wound rolls. Whoa. <laughs> Oh my god, these melee characters are insano. <laughs> They're so good. Uh, what else is really good are these ranged weapon upgrades. So we have the Balethorn Cannon making a reappearance, and it has uh, got a significant glow up from the terrible uh, Ignore Invulnerable Save Stranglethorn than it used to be. Uh, now it is D3 plus 3 damage shots. It is a strangle weapon, uh, Stranglethorn profile. It is Blast. You can't shoot it in melee, unfortunately. But Strength 10, AP3, 3 damage. So between 4 and 6 attacks with a 3 damage range 36 gun. Holy crap. Shard Gullet is similarly impressive. Range 36, Assaults 3. Importantly, not Blast because it's a heavy Venom cannon. Strength 12, AP5, 5 damage. 5 damage! 5 damage. There are ways to give you exploding 6s to hit as well uh, in uh, multiple different ways to do that, which means that you could potentially be uh, exploding your 6s on these huge, enormous, multi-damage guns too. A uh, little bit less uh, consistent, but you can be trying to get some some big explosions out of these guys which is which is pretty good what is a glow up <laughs> it's when it's when uh somebody who's relatively ugly gets uh gets a makeover and looks looks uh is positively glowing uh yeah so these weapons are these ranged weapons are insane they're so good uh i think there are certainly going to be a list that has two or three foot hive tyrants um, sitting in your back line, just lobbing gunshots at people all game. And again, triggering those abilities like potentially voracious ammunition. If you've taken that to ping for another D3 mortal wounds after you hit them with the big gun, um, you could be taking uh, the shard lure, I think it's what it's called, where you buff their the charge range of a unit because you've hit somebody with a synapse creature with their big gun. Pretty cool. Gestation sack, I think, is a, a, a sleeper pick here. Uh, it gives you an action you do in the shooting phase. It completes at the end of the shooting phase. So you just take your, your shooting off. But importantly, you don't actually have to have a range weapon to do this. So you could have, for example, a Broodlord or a Neurothrope or, you know, anything that doesn't have a gun and isn't advancing around the table every turn. You just spawn D3 plus one Ripper Swarms. So... Ripper Swarms aren't that impressive by themselves, but it essentially allows you to double your model count or your unit count on an objective at any time, anytime you want to. So you just, uh, they don't cost reinforcement points, uh, uh, importantly. So you just, you know, you're like, oh, I need to go next turn. I'm going to need another unit on this objective or I'm going to need to go do something else. You know, essentially for one CP, because you paid the CP to get an additional relic, uh, you just get a Ripper Swarm unit. Sick. I would much rather, you know, be able to, to pick this depending on the matchup or depending on the mission, but having it in your lineup is actually pretty good. Not to say that Ripper Swarms are particularly powerful, but having an extra unit wherever you need it to be where that character is, is actually powerful. So I think this one's actually pretty sweet. Uh, the Dirge Heart of Karis um, lets you pick something to lose objective secured. It's pretty good, but I think you're generally going to be wanting to kill that thing instead of uh, making it lose objective secured. Uh, we do see a return of the arachnocyte glands, now called the Passenger, gives you plus two to advance and charge rolls. Um, again, we're probably going to be trying to cast Onslaught every turn, 
So plus two to advance and charge means essentially plus four inches on your maximum threat range. If you are um, in a situation where you can select synaptic link your onslaught to that person, which means that something like a flying hive tyrant with this upgrade is going to be moving 17 inches because importantly you put this on a unit with adrenal glands but it doesn't replace its adrenal glands so you already get the plus one to move you're then advancing plus two charging plus two so you're moving an additional five inches off your base profile that's pretty good seer hive is a really interesting one uh i think a lot of people were talking about taking this um in order to fight things like transhuman effects enemy transhuman effects uh, and especially so that you don't have to be burning rerolls to reroll wounds. And especially since, uh, against something like Emperor's Auspice, um, you know, Custodi's defensive effect will have no, no power against you because all of your attacks automatically wound. That's it. All your melee attacks, they just wound. If you hit them, they wound. It's fine. Now, importantly, the, the thing to keep in mind there, that sounds super duper busted, but the important thing to keep in mind is that your... Um, uh, it, it's non-monster, non-vehicle, so obviously not big stuff. It's only infantry. And your units with the hardest hitting melee weapons are going to be equipped with different relics. So this eats your relic slot. There is, I think the one unit that this is super, super exciting on is potentially the Trigon Prime because Trigon Primes now have an immense number of two damage attacks rather than having a relatively low volume of D6 damage attacks. And so uh, they have 12 base attacks. Being able to automatically wound with 12 attacks, uh, and I think they have a tail attack as well, so 13 total attacks, automatically wounding every time you hit. We're getting somewhere. We're getting somewhere. It's pretty good. Um, again, this doesn't uh, replace your Toxin Sacks, so you will still get your Toxin Sack ability on a monster or vehicle unit. Uh, you just won't get the automatic wound. You'll just get the Dream Rot Might effect, essentially. That's just a little bit less of a... Of a uh, of an important one. So I, I think as you can see here, you know, we have some builds for some absolutely insane melee characters with, you know, things like Seer Hive, with things like Sides of Tyran, uh, with uh, weapons like Reaper of Obliterax or the Maw Claws. All of those can, you know, you can start to build some of these Flying Hive Tyrant builds that just do ridiculous damage. And uh, I'm here for it. I'm super psyched. It's important to remember also that, you know, a lot of these are going to be in conjunction with um, either synaptic imperative abilities, which we'll still haven't talked about, but we will. Don't worry, I'll get there. Or um, with voracious appetite to reroll all your wound rolls. So these things are going to be doing just absolute insane damage. Uh, chapter approved rules. Let's talk about some secondaries. Synaptic insight is back. Who cares? Throw it out. It's garbage. Um, this is uh, the weirdest one for sure. Cranial feasting gives you command points. If you have killed enemies with a hive tendril model with feeder tendrils, or excuse me, uh, you get that you have a chance to regenerate command points anytime. Uh, is that right? Mm -mm. Unfortunately, it's cut off here, so it's a little bit. I, I'm, I haven't parsed through this one uh, quite as well. Yes. So anytime you kill a character or unit champion, so that's something like a space marine sergeant or you know an exarch or something like that. Uh, you get a chance to regenerate a command point. If you have feeder tendrils, something like a uh, gene stealer or a lictor, you'll get a bonus to regenerate your command point. That's cool. Your secondary objective chat is regenerating UCP. And importantly, it that unit champion is very, uh, you know, key is there is very important there because it's not just characters. It's not assassinate with extra steps. If your opponent is playing space marines with a billion combat squads or a billion five-man, you know, squads, each one of those has a unit champion in it. So every one of those you kill in melee has the potential to score you points on this. Both command points and victory points. Super cool. You get, if you regenerate one or more command points during the battle, immediately you score three VP. Full stop. Sick. Uh, each time you kill a character in melee, you get a point. So it's like a little tiny mini assassination. In addition, you get three points if you kill the enemy warlord in melee as well. So, I'm going to be honest. I don't think that this is very good. But I do think it's very cool. And there are going to be situations where it actually comes into play quite a bit. Again, those space marine armies that have a billion insurgents in them. Uh, those uh, Eldar armies with a lot of aspect warriors and a lot of exarchs. Most of the time, you're very rarely clearing those in range. You're going to be shooting them down in range and then killing them in melee, which means you get a victory point uh, and you potentially get CP. And then if you get CP, you get additional victory points. There's going to be situations in which this is really good, and especially if you're like finding that you don't regenerate CP very often. Maybe value this one a little bit highly. 
you you score less victory points overall but your gameplay is more consistent because you get more cp i think it's a very cool design of a secondary whether it's playable i don't think so but or I think it's a little bit playable. I wouldn't take it, you know, I would take it as a flex pick, but maybe not every time. One uh, secondary you can build your army around is Spore Nodes, however. This is the Shadow Operation secondary. It gives you this incredible action to score vic four victory points. You perform the action if you're within six inches of your opponent's deployment zone uh, and not within six inches of a marker placed by the action previously. So you can't do it in the same spot multiple times. Um... It does, it is within six inches of your opponent's deployment zone, but it is a little bit funky because you do have to, um, you do have to place the marker uh, wholly within your opponent's deployment zone, which means you have to be a little bit closer to actually complete the action successfully. Uh, when the action's completed, so it starts at the end of your movement phase, it's completed at the end of your turn, so it's a single round action. It can only be performed by troops, that's important. This is the gargoyle thing. The gar Your gargoyles are gonna be trying to do this as often as possible. And, Every time you successfully complete it, you put a little marker down within one inches of your unit, wholly within your opponent's deployment zone. So again, it, you, it says within six inches of your uh, opponent's deployment zone, but you kind of have to be within one inch of them. So they have to be a little bit closer. Uh, as soon as you do that, you get four points. You get it four points or four times a game, you're done. Easy peasy. Um, again, this is probably unlikely that you get this done on turn one. Uh, actually, it's impossible, I think. But you can start to do it with gargoyles very quickly. Gargoyles are troops that are very quick, and you can uh, be using things like borrowers and the uh, gargoyle, uh, the flying unit redeploy strat and circle the prey um, in order to deep strike them into your opponent's deployment zone and start placing those markers. So I actually think that this is absolutely sick. Oh no, the bots have attacked. Go away, bots. Get out of here. We don't like you. So I think this is the... This isn't going to be super duper powerful every single game. Um, but if you build your army around it, it's going to be very good. Let's keep moving. Oof. All right. Before we move on, let's talk about some synaptic imperatives here, chat, because this is super duper important. Wow, I've I've time I've like previewed this so many times, but this is uh, probably the coolest and most transformative mechanic in this entire uh, army so far. So, Space Marines, right? They have their combat doctrines. Uh, the uh, Grey Knights they have their Tides of the Warp. Custodians have their Martial Katas. Tyranids now have Synaptic Imperatives. This ability is super cool. Essentially. Every battle round, start of the battle round, so if you're going second, you'll have to kind of plan ahead a little bit. You will pick a synaptic imperative for one of your synapse creatures that is currently on the table. So, uh, when you pick that imperative, each, each one out of the list can only be picked once per game. It gives a, essentially a six inch aura to whichever unit that you selected. So for example, we're gonna say turn one, I don't wanna get shot by enemies with huge guns. So I will choose to activate the Zonethrope Synaptic Imperative for the, God damn it, bots. I'm talking about Synaptic Imperatives. Go away. Um, all right. So let, so we're not, we, wanna, we don't wanna get shot by last cannons turn one. So we have a unit of zone thropes in the center of our army. On the start of the first battle round, we say, I'm going to activate the zone thrope synaptic comparative warp shielding. It gives them this six inch aura. Everything within six inches of them, uh, if it's a monster, gets a four plus invulnerable save. If it's not a monster, gets a five plus invulnerable save for the remainder of that battle round. Once that's done, you can no longer pick the zone thrope synaptic imperative for the remainder of the game it's done but then next battle round you will choose another one of your synapse creatures uh and you will use their synaptic imperative so for example then you know our opponent gets up in our face battle round two we're going to pick the hive tyrant one relentless ferocity everything within six inches of that hive tyrant can now fall back in charge this is this mechanic is so cool because you're going to have a lot of synapse creatures in your army you're going to have a lot of different options for uh 
the order in which you use your synaptic imperatives. I do think the most important one is going to be the zone throw one because it protects you against alpha strikes. That four plus invulnerable save is super duper cool. I mean, so four plus invulnerable save on monsters, five plus on all your infantry. Super powerful to keep your guys alive. And there are a lot of other defensive auras that we can talk about in the codex later on that are also going to be buffed or going to synergize with that to make you very difficult to, to alpha strike down. Um, so that one I think is the most important, and that and you're probably going to see zone thropes in the army for the most part, uh, pretty pretty consistently because of just specifically because of that, and especially in monster focused armies that want to be deploying on the line and pushing up aggressively. So you know something like whether or not it's legal, a crusher stampede, you will be able to crusher you know bump all those crusher stampede models up to a four plus and vulnerable save immediately as soon as the first battle round goes uh you can play a crusher stampede you know like army in uh without using crusher stampede in this book and uh the zone throws are going to help there quite a bit but then afterwards you have you know more much more uh, situational abilities so for example uh Turvagons make you faster sick seems good um neurothropes make you better at casting psychic powers again we're we're already getting into it right your psychic powers your psychic phase is so consistent um you have you already have access to a plus one to cast and a reroll from relics and warlord traits and then neurothropes can passively give the entire army depending on how things are um are deployed an additional plus one to cast super good um, the other important ones, I think, are Tyranid Primes and Tyranid Warriors. Tyranid Warriors give you Exploding Sixes in melee. Tyranid Primes give you Exploding Sixes to shoot uh, if you're within 24 inches. Importantly, none of these are core keyworded. They will affect your entire army, whether you're a monster or an infantry or whatever. So a warrior unit can be pulsing out. And you can, you can imagine a nine-man warrior unit. This is one of the reasons that these big units are very important. Um, a nine-man warrior unit... It, it, in, impacts an enormous frontage of the you know the front line of the fight so pulsing out this six inch uh exploding sixes aura means it's going to be affecting not only the warriors themselves but also other warrior units around them also your hormigons also your hive tyrants anything that's in that area of the table is going to get this enormous buff to its uh to its fight phase damage output and the same goes for the tyranid prime aura um and then you have some more uh i think sort of flexible options in things like the, the uh, High Tyrant's ability to fall back and charge, in the Neurothrope's ability to pump your Psychic Powers once per turn if you need to. Um, yeah. So this ability is super powerful. I think generally speaking, what we're going to see is a zone, unit of Zone Thropes will pump the entire army with an invulnerable save, Battle Round 1, to keep you safe from that Alpha Strike. Battle Round 2, you're going to be much closer to the fight, and you're going to start, you're probably going to pump the Tyranid Prime Aura Round 2 to buff your ranged attacks, then round three, once you're stuck into the fight, you're going to pump the Tyranid Warrior Aura to give everybody exploding sixes in melee. Now, there's a couple other ways to interact with this. The first one, and one of the reasons I think that High Fleet Leviathan is going to get taken most often, is the High Fleet Leviathan Psychic Power. The Psychic Power chooses one of these units that's in synaptic link range of the caster, could potentially be the caster themselves even, then chooses another unit in synaptic link range. So you can you can link, you know, through the synaptic link, it's very evocative, you can link the synapse creature that's imperativing to something else. Whatever, the second unit you pick is affected by whatever the synaptic imperative ability of the first unit you selected is. So for example, let's say that you have a big monster that's sitting in the back of your army and is going to be in a uh, gunfight with an enemy tank. So you cast that spell on them. You pick a zone throat unit that you, you link to a zone throat unit to give a four plus and vulnerable save that you then link to that monster. It gets a four plus and vulnerable save for the remainder of the turn. Already sounds super powerful, right? In addition, you could also use it for the, um, the more damage oriented buffs. You can use it, for example, to link a Tyranid warrior unit to themselves uh, I actually will. I, let me double check that <laughs> so I know, so I don't misspeak. It's not another. Uh, 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 uh. Select one friendly Leviathan unit, then select one synaptic imperative ability 
from a model that is also in synaptic link range. Yes, so you can do it the same. Uh, you can you can have them the same. Uh, it's important that these are also in addition to whatever synaptic link is currently active. It doesn't replace the active synaptic link. So you could you could you know for example pick a warrior unit, link themselves, and then in addition to getting for example a buff to their ranged attacks from a prime or a buff to their uh, uh, invulnerable save from a zone throop unit they will also get exploding sixes in melee so this power is absolutely sick you basically just get to double up on whatever one of these like super powerful abilities you get uh you want every single turn it's uh super crazy and i believe that this is agnostic of whether or not you've picked that already yeah so you 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 basically just keep replaying the same synaptic imperative abilities over and over, uh, as long as you keep casting that psychic power. So, yeah. Anyway, this is <laughs> super cool. Um, you can also, I believe, for example, use that ability to uh, tell something to fall back in charge because you're eligible to declare a charge in that turn in which you fell back. Um, you can kind of sort of retroactively allow them to fall back in charge. Um, you can Trigon Prime somebody so that when they die, they will uh, they will explode with extra damage. Like the the amount of functionality that comes from this ability is insane, chat. So you can imagine, right? We're before the game, we're switching out our sub faction abilities. During the game, we're picking our army or our, our aura wide synaptic link abilities. Oh no! Go away! <laughs> Go away! The bots are back. God damn it. All right. Um, so, so you can switch out your sub-faction abilities. You can also be repeating those sub-faction abilities. And then there's a stratagem to replay a, or to play a synaptic imperative ability on your warlord from one of these units that was killed already uh, over the course of the game. Um, all synaptic, synaptic creatures get the... Uh, imperative is that the case uh, 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 uh. I guess so yes so it's so it's an aura from all of your stand up scriptures is that right uh, is it all of them in link range or no Well, Chad, the, I see the uh, I see the spam because uh, they post like ten messages in a row. If you just continue to post the same message, the same person just copy pasts the same message ten times in a row. I would definitely see it. <laughs> okay, yeah, you're right, Chad. So it's not just the one unit that's uh, that's benefiting that that's projecting the aura. It's everything. Yeah, that's a good that's a good uh, that's a good call, Chad. Um, I think that. Yeah, I don't know how much that changes the ability, to be honest. I think a six-inch aura from a big unit is, especially early game, is going to be a pretty big deal. But um, certainly for stuff like the Hive Tyrant ability to fall back and charge, I think that's, uh, yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, all right. Good. Me a couple, chat. Thanks for thanks for setting me straight on that one. Anyway, I hope you get the uh, you you get the idea that this ability is super duper cool. <laughs> Basically, it's as if your um. Your like martial katas could be selected differently every turn, and you had a, a different option, a different selection of them, um, depending on the different like custodies that were in your army. That's sick, right? That ability is super cool. Anyway, we've done it. We've talked about all the abilities. Oh my god! Woo, chat. This army is so sick. I think uh, this com the command phase or pre-battle round uh, sort of selection phase of this game is going to be super duper, super duper cool. I'm super excited for all of the all of the little cards I get to make about all the, the cool effects you can give to your to your units. Now this the uh, uh, the imperatives and your special warlord traits and stuff like that are on top of the other abilities that your units may or may not have. So basically. Um, we've, we've already seen the winged hive tyrant data sheet, right? And it has this will of the hive mind ability. So that is pick a core unit within synaptic link range. They reroll hit rolls of one. Uh, like I said in my previous video, the, 
Hive Tyrant's basically a, a tyranid captain now, and instead of having an aura of reroll ones like a, tier, a, ca a space marine captain would, it's pick something within range and they get they get access to that ability. Fortunately, these are not these aren't your daddy's synaptic link abilities, chat. Warzone Octarius is far behind us. We're in Warzone Knockmoon now, and these synaptic abil link abilities will stack on top of one another, unlike the previous ones, which means that you can be. Um, if we if we go and talk about like a, a Mr. Swarm Lord here, right? We can be full rerolling our hit rolls. We can get plus one AP from a Brood Lord. We can um, get um, plus one to hit from the Warlord trait. We can get exploding sixes to hit from the Warrior Imperative, and you can cycle. You can siphon those all to a single unit. You can't double up on one unit uh with the same ability obviously because that they, they don't stack but you can stack different abilities on top of each other which means you can be like plus one to hit exploding sixes full rerolls to hit uh plus one ap um there's a i don't know there's a bunch of other ones <laughs> and uh you just do a bunch of a, a ton of stuff and they, they you throw their um especially for your core unit so it's especially that stuff like tyranid warriors you throw their damage output absolutely through the roof which is super cool Yeah, chat. They stack now. They stack now. They stack now. Yep. Um, the 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 restriction is essentially that you can't be selected to to be buffed by the same ability multiple times. Uh, and generally speaking, they they won't like the rerolls and stuff like that won't stack. But pretty good. All right. So let's move on to some data sheets here, chat. Ugh, I'm gonna take a drink real quick. Woo. Um, so they, they, it isn't, uh, I know some people are mentioning there's no instinctive behavior anymore, so that's gone, um, which is, I think, totally fine. It is what it is. But the fearless aura from Synapse has been reduced to only six inches rather than the full 12 or 18 from Hive Tyrants. So you don't, you no longer have instinctive behavior, but your non-Synapse infantry are going to be much more susceptible to running away. So you're, like I mentioned before, that having kind of interim synapse creatures that are embedded in your army in order to forward your synaptic link chain but those are also going to be important to uh maintain your anti uh anti uh leadership bubbles so you only gain fearless when you're within six inches of somebody so you want to be keeping them close together uh dylan gaming what does it mean for something to be fast attack uh, it means that it takes a fast... That's its battlefield role, so it takes a fast attack slot uh, in, when you're building your list. Um, Nasty Nas, what should you do, uh, buy to start a Tyranid army? Well, probably start with some Hive Tyrants. Let's talk about them. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's move on. So uh, we have the Hive Tyrant data sheets here. One thing to keep in mind is that anything that's Hive Tyrant keyworded can only be... Uh, in, uh, included ones per detachment. So, Winged Hive Tyrants, unfortunately, as cool as they are, we can't take unit, or detachments of three of them because I would certainly be doing that. And we're capped to three total Hive Tyrants in the entirety of our army. Um, we've already talked about the Winged Hive Tyrant datasheet. We've talked about the abilities, or the, the relics and things we can give it. Uh, it's a base strength seven. It has five base attacks. You can give it two additional attacks with uh, Scything Talons. You can buff those with plus one damage either through the Behemoth Relic or through uh, the size of Tyron. Alternatively, we can take the Reaper of Obliterax and uh, be swinging five times with a big uh, three damage plus one automatic mortal wound bone sword that can't be ignored. Um, this dude's going to, he's hes super fast and he's going to do a billion damage in melee. And that is what the winged hive, hive, hive tyrant is here for. The foot hive tyrant is a little bit more interesting because it, instead of having wings, has two weapon slots. Now, interestingly, there. There might be a typo on this data sheet. We're not 100% sure. It comes stock with a set of Scything Talons and a Lash Whip. But uh, it can replace those with a Venom Cannon, Strangle Thorn Cannon, or uh, a Venom Cannon, Strangle Thorn Cannon. Um, the model can't be equipped with both a Venom Cannon and Strangle Thorn Cannon, but there's nothing that says it can't double up on those, which the going theory is that uh, it currently is an oversight. Um, so currently, you can build a Hive Tyrant, and also, importantly, uh, it doesn't, even if it didn't double up on those, you, you, it doesn't, how that interacts with Relics, I don't know. If you take a Stranglethorn Cannon and then upgrade it to a 
uh, the uh, the relic Stranglethorn Cannon, can you then take a second Stranglethorn Cannon? I doubt it, but I, don't, I have no idea. Or can you take a relic Stranglethorn Cannon and a Venom Cannon? I don't know. Um, this probably needs to be clarified. It's a little bit awkward. But currently, you can take two Venom Cannons on the Hive Tyrant. So you shoot six times within a Strength 9 AP3 4 damage gun. Probably un... Probably un... Uh, unintended i would imagine and that might get that might get faq'd out um importantly though this guy is plus one toughness and plus one save over the regular hive tyrant he's uh goes to toughness eight with the two plus armor save and you can take a gun in addition to your melee loadout so he can have a similar melee loadout to the regular flying hive tyrant he doesn't have the talons that was a question mark that we had in the, the previous video but um he does have uh he does just have a, you know an extra set of arms so you can be taking these relatively slower, more powerful melee-oriented versions that have, for example, uh, you know, two sets of monster scything talents. Importantly, if you take the size of Tyran, excuse me, they only it only replaces one set of scything talents. So you would be making your seven attacks, you know, five attacks plus two for the relic with the three damage profile, then two attacks with the regular talent profile. So in that at that point, you might as well just start taking uh, a regular venom cannon. Although, importantly, these are uh, heavy weapons now. So if you're looking to advance and charge with Onslaught, you can't equip those. Now, the other big loss here is one thing that we can see uh, missing is that there are no little guns on this guy. So I have to, my heart goes out to everybody, and including myself, who painstakingly modeled Twin Link Devourers for their Hive Tyrants. It appears that those Twin Link Devourers and uh death spitters and all that stuff uh, have, have gone the way of the dodo and you can only take cannons and melee weapons on your tyrants now which is a tragedy and i i was when i was looking at that high fleet hydra i was looking at the the relic for full rerolls on your wound rolls and i was like whoa this thing's gonna be sick on a dude with 24 shots unfortunately his loadout doesn't exist anymore and you cannot take the devourers which is sad Fortunately, their melee profile is awesome. Now, I'm much more interested in the Flying Hive Tyrant than I am the, the, the Foot Hive Tyrant, just for the, the simple fact that he is significantly faster, almost twice as fast. Um, that said, I think there is probably a build that focuses on melee, on, on Foot Hive Tyrants, and just uses them as your backline artillery uh, with those relic um, ranged weapons. So having a five damage gun, one guy with a five damage gun, one guy with a uh, the three damage gun, and uh the relic weapons and then they also have this pretty powerful melee profile to back it up as well um which means that they can play this kind of mid-board game they can peck at you with shooting it's an annoying profile to get hit by you're like please stop shooting my tank for 15 damage i beg of you uh and then once you get in close to try to contest them over objectives they're like hey what's up i have like five attacks at three damage or at strength 10 and then they cut you in half that's pretty good um, that's all facilitated by Tyrant Guard, but we'll talk about Tyrant Guard later. <laughs> that prof that, uh, that game plan would not be quite as good if, uh, that unit wasn't untargetable by range, by range attacks, but we'll cover it. Don't worry, chat. <laughs> um, the Swarm Lord is also a Hive Tyrant. Now, we talked about his data sheet when it was foiled initially. Importantly, no Hive Commander on this guy's sheet here. He can't double move. Instead, he gives you Chapter Master, full rerolls to hit on a core unit within Synaptic Link range. Again, as we've talked about a bunch of times, synaptic link range is so long. If you're assembling your army correctly, you can pass that full rerolls across the entirety of the table and put it on anyone who you want. And with the ability to equip both powerful melee loadouts and ranged loadouts on the same unit, your full rerolls and your plus one to hit effects are going to be that much more impactful because they're affecting both a ranged attack and a melee attack. In addition, you also have some effects like toxin sacks and the Tyranid Warrior um, synaptic imperative. <laughs> Lost my train of thought there. Uh, to explode sixes that allow you to fish for results. So, for example, you have your warriors. They're charging a knight or whatever. And you get plus one to hit from the, the plus one to hit warlord trait. You get full rerolls from Swarm Lord, and you have Toxin Sacks, so your sixes automatically wound. Um, now you just you, you just fish for sixes because your sixes will explode, automatically wound, and then your plus one to hit, so most of your attacks will hit anyway. Um, it's it's almost essentially the uh, Tyranid Prime plus Relentless Flurry combo that the previous version of the book uh, out of Warzone Octaria saw with the Leviathan supplement, um, but you can do it on anyone who's core 
and it's super effective. I think, so, so in addition, obviously, Swarm Lord also gives you objective secured or double objective secured. Um, again, I think that's super powerful. I think Swarm Lord is very much still going to be an auto-include in a lot of tier armies because his melee profile is very good. He's much tankier than he was in the previous version. He's a little bit easier to kill in melee, depending on your profile. Um, but his support effects are probably just as imp impactful. Good stuff. <laughs> Swarm Lord in chat. Hey, what's up, Swarm what's up, Lord? Fam? Tyrant's profile has the same wording as the Fex. As worded, you can take two cannons of the same type, but not one of each. Is that a mistake? Magnus did nothing wrong. Thanks for the super chat, man. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so we, we were just talking about that. It looks like it's probably a typo. You can't take both heavy weapons, but you can take two of the same heavy weapon currently. I have to imagine that that's an oversight. In addition, how this interacts with relics and warlord trade, or with relics specifically, I also don't know. If you take a Stranglethorn cannon, can you also take the the five damage venom cannon? I have no idea. Because it replaces a venom cannon, right? But you would have to have had a venom cannon at some point. 40k needs a needs a flow chart of list building of when you do that, all that stuff. I imagine that you can't replace the relic weapons, but I you currently can take two venom cannons, which is probably not the not the uh, not correct. All right. Um, so we talked about Stormlord. I think Stormlord is great. I think because you're going to be fighting over the center of the table so much, being able to... A lot of this codex is going to be about supercharging a unit and then rocketing them out and being able to throw full rerolls, objective secured, plus one to hit, exploding sixes, all this stuff on that unit and then just shooting them off is going to be a big deal. Uh, so while Swarmlord doesn't necessarily rocket units like he did in the past with his double move ability, he does help supercharge them even farther. And then again, we're going to be using our almost auto-cast psychic powers to be further buffing them with advancing and charging and, and uh, additional buffs. <laughs> yeah, chat. Yeah, just use your converted quad devourers as a double venom cannon, and it's fine. There you go. Um... We got the Broodlord here. I, I mentioned before, he does have a Synaptic Link ability. It gives you plus one uh, AP on Wound Rolls of Six. It's not that cool of an ability. It's totally fine, but it's kind of whatever. His uh, He actually got a huge downgrade on his melee profile. Um, he no longer gets additional damage on uh, Wound Rolls of Six in melee. Sad. All of the Gene Stalers did get Vanguard Predator, which gives them a uh, nine inch forward deploy which is very nice. And he does have a four plus invulnerable save now rather than a, his his old crappy five plus. But overall, I do think the Broodlord is probably real bad. And I don't know if I would play him, which is a sad thing to say, but I don't like this guy. What I do like is this Neurothrope though. The Neurothrope uh, I think has gone from already being the one of the best HQ choices in the codex to uh, instead taking probably one of the spots of the best HQ choices in the game. It's Warp Siphon ability has been changed entirely. It uh, no longer has a weird old ruling uh, wording that made it impossible to actually use on anything. Instead, now it has a Synaptic Link ability that picks any Psyker, not just Core. So you can use it on High Tyrants. You can use it on uh, Maliceptors. You can use it on anything. It gives it roll additional die, discard one on your Psychic tests. On top of that, the Neurothrope all adds plus one to its own Psychic tests permanently, full stop. That's cumulative with other psychic te test bonuses. So, for example, if this guy has the resonance barb, he's now plus two to cast. If he's used his own um, synaptic imperative, he's plus three to cast. He ha can take perfectly adapted out of High Fleet Leviathan to get a free reroll to cast, and he can warp siphon himself to roll an additional d6 and discard one of the dice. Unlike the previous version, Neurothropes also now know two powers from the hive mind discipline rather than just one and still casts two now also denies two instead of just one this is by the way before we <laughs> get too far he's only five points more than the current version only five points what's happening right now uh he still maintains his ability to heal uh neurothropes and zonthropes when he kills them or kills models with smite so he can uh, pass wounds to them after uh, he smites people to death but basically what you can be doing is if you want to wombo combo it out you can dump all of the buffs on him. So Synaptic Imperative him, 
Uh, Resonance Barb him. He's got his own Psychic Node. He Warp Siphons himself. Then you Synaptic Channeling a power to him, and you Power of the Hive Mind to cast three times. He's now casting pl three spells at plus three, um, plus three to cast, additional die, discard the lowest, and if he's perfectly adapted, he's rerolling one of his failed casts. This dude just sits in the back of your table edge and automatically casts three powers. If you have a CP reroll in the bank, which you should, I mean... The chances of failing a, a not double ones to cast on three dice drop the lowest with a reroll is all is astronomically small, and you have potentially two rerolls available to do that. So he should just get three powers off. You just get them. It should not be a question whether or not the Neurothrope will cast your powers. He'll just do it. This guy's insane. He's so good, dude. Oh my god. He's also, yeah, he's maintained his three plus invulnerable save. I'll give you a little spoiler alert here. He, the, the zone throws have not, but he has also, it gets better. It gets better. He went up a wound a toughness and an attack, although he lost a weapon skill. So it's kind of, it's kind of whatever, but so he's harder to kill. He casts more consistently. He buffs the rest of your army casting and he uh, has additional denies for five points more than his previous version. And I was already taking his previous version. The Neurothrope, your, every list should have a Neurothrope. If you don't have a Neurothrope in it, you're not playing real Tyranids. Go out and get yourselves a Neurothrope right now. This guy's like, he's so freaking good. All right, let's talk about Tyranid Primes. I'm done. I'm I'm just assuming every list has a Neurothrope in it. Like, it's just it's just dumb. It's just so dumb. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, Gnarl, is the Spirit Leash wins three per unit? Per phase or three total per phase um it's per model i believe yeah a model regains one last wound to a maximum of three i i i would i believe it's per model because model is the uh, operative term in the sentence there oh my gosh also yeah chat yeah he's transhuman in lobby as well oh man Neurothropes are so ridiculous. Tyranny Primes, we talked about their data sheet already. Uh, there's not much else to talk about here. One thing important, I think important thing to note now that we've seen their points value is that Venom Cannons are free on this model. All right, sure. Because you're always taking a Venom Cannon, I guess. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, you could just have a Venom Cannon for free. It's like whatever. Oh, you got a Devour, a little five shot Devour. Would you like a Venom Cannon instead? Oh, okay. I guess. I guess I'll take a Venom Cannon for no additional cost. Sounds good to me. Might be a typo. I don't know. Um, he gives you uh, reroll wounds of one in your command phase. Importantly, a warrior unit unlocks an additional uh, HQ slot for this guy. And, and as I think we're probably seeing, uh, HQ slots may be in, in high demand. So... Um, or I guess, I mean, maybe not if you're if you're limited on how many uh, Hive Tyrants you can take. But having a, a free HQ slot for the Tyranid Prime is going to be pretty good. I do think HQ is certainly the strongest um, uh, the strongest battlefield role in Tyranids right now, as it was in the previous version. HQ and troops also always basically got all the love, and then the rest were kind of throwaway garbage. And that's essentially still what we're going to see. Although it's kind of being limited on the number of Hive Tyrants we can take has certainly... Um, reduced some of the strain a little bit uh the turvagon got a, a bunch of stat increases i think um the turvagon itself actually looks pretty sick the the massive scything talon profile that we saw um uh, we see a, a couple things have the malice scepter has this profile as well is way better than it used to be it's either a 2d3 damage strength 10 attack strength 10 whoa or it's your base strength so strength 7 uh with that doubles your attacks so it's either eight attacks at two damage, uh, strength seven, or four attacks at strength 10, two uh, D three damage, eight B four. So uh, it's much better in melee. Um, Stinger Salvo has also doubled their number of attacks. They shoot eight times now, much better at shooting. The downside uh, is that uh, it's synaptic link only affects termagants. It does have this cool ability where if it's next to, if it's within one inch of a 15 man or, or larger termagant unit, it's actually untargetable. So it can, it can be character protected by termagants essentially. Um, and it spawns termagants. So the termagant spawning ability got much more powerful. Once per game, you just get a unit of 10 termagants with flesh borers. It doesn't cost you any points. You no longer have to bank points for it. It just happens. In addition, uh, or alternatively, you can pick a termagant unit within six inches and return 2d6 of them. Um, again, just like the endless swarm ability, these are going to be, these are, uh, simultaneous respawns, not sequential respawns. So you only get like three extra inches out of your unit when you're placing them. 
but uh, and they also have to set up wholly within six inches of the uh, the turbogon itself. So it's the the positioning is pretty constrained, but um, it's pretty good. This also happens uh, in your command phase, so it's before you score command points. So any of these respawn abilities uh, mean that you could be stealing objectives from people by putting more turbogons down. The uh, it is important to note, I think that the new Termagant unit that you spawn is not objective secured because it's not in a detachment. Um, but it's nice to have. You get 10 more models on it. I don't know. The profile itself on the Turbogon is pretty impressive. It's 17 wounds now. So they, they've they <laughs> they've couched themselves a little bit. They're like, oh, it won't put it at 18. So it can still be obscured. So that's good. But it is like an absolute tank. This thing will not die quickly. Uh, T8, 17 wounds, 2 plus armor save you can give it again you can put it to toughness nine and give it a five plus damage ignore so you can make it just impossible to kill and it actually is a does appreciable damage in melee now um a lot of the buffs that we've talked about previously though can't be used on these guys because they are the, the snatch comparatives can but the uh targeted buffs can't be because uh they're not core keyworded so these ones are characters. These and, and Hive Tyrants obviously are characters. And a lot of the monsters are, are not core keyworded. So you can't, you know, dump all of the buffs on them to make them hit super duper hard. But again, the support abilities to theoretically make up for it. So I don't dislike Turbagons. I think that the downside of Turbagons is that the Termagant profile is not super good. And this is a unit entirely designed around buffing Termagants. And I don't know if they're that worth it. So, I don't know. We'll find out. They might be okay. Uh, we can move on to the Trigon Prime. That's been moved from the heavy support slot to the HQ slot, which is pretty nice. Again, uh, I talked about it a little bit before, but this is the highest attack volume character in the Codex. It has 12 attacks! Chat, 12! Uh, it has its own set of Scything Talons. It doesn't have um, the regular Scything Talon profile where you get plus one attack per which makes it a little bit easier to calculate how many attacks this thing has, because the last version was a little bit confusing. Um, its weapon has no special abilities. It just has 12 base attacks. So it's it's a two damage AP3 weapon. It doesn't sound that exciting, except you just have a thousand attacks in the profile. So uh, if you're using your auto wounding thing, that's pretty cool. Um, I th The downside is I, I'm not sure that Trigon Primes, because they uh, are... They're just big, they're big dudes, they're not super fast. They're move 10, move 11 with a adrenal gland. Um, they do get obscured, they're only 14 wounds, but again, they're only 14 wounds, so, and T7, so they're not super hard to kill without a built-in invulnerable save. They have no invulnerable save. Uh, they're minus one to be hit in melee now, and that's actually all the sneaky boys have that, which is pretty nice to have. Um, but they uh, otherwise aren't super impressive. Now, if you're able to put adaptive physiologies on them, you can give this guy a 4 plus and vulnerable save. And at that point, I'm much more interested in the Trigon, uh, especially because the Synaptic Link ability gives core units plus one to advance and charge. And sin since, like I said before, you're probably you're, the game plan is going to be that we're going to advance a unit and then onslaught them and they're going to charge, meaning that you're basically giving plus two inches to their threat range with this ability. So his ability is very good. His melee profile, if you're not going into damage reduction, is okay. He can synergize with a lot of uh, relics and warlord traits. The awkward part is that uh, he's very easy to kill unless it gets eroded so that he can be... Um, Dermic Symbiosis, and then he has a 4-plus invulnerable save, and then he's basically a Hive Tyrant with, a, with upside, which is pretty cool. All right, let's move on. Old One-Eye. Old One-Eye got some big changes here. Whether or not they, they pull him out of the dumpster, I don't know. Uh, but he's very different than his previous version. Previously, Old One-Eye had this entire game plan around uh, stacking bonuses to hit, and then using those to improve his exploding attacks effect. It was a very weird and inconsistent, well, not super inconsistent, but it was uh, in, what's the word? Um, it was uh, hard to explain to people. It was a, uh, it was just a very strange ability to have, especially for this big Carnifex dude. Now he just makes a, a approximately 1 million attacks. Uh, he gets D3 plus 1, so he has 6 attacks when he, when he, uh, when he shows up. He gets two extra attacks from his monster Scything Talons, so we're up to eight. He gets D3 plus one additional attacks when he charges, so we're up to potentially 12. And then his a Thresher Scythe weapon makes an additional three attacks uh, when you um, 
uh, when you fight. So he has 14 total attacks. Three of them are at four damage, AP one, one damage, or three of them are at uh, strength four, one damage. Two of them are strength set or strength six, excuse me, two damage. S uh, potentially up to 10 of them are at D3 plus two damage. That all sounds good. He also gives a plus one to hit to a Carnifex within nine inches. Unfortunately, um, interestingly, he, he can also pick himself with that, which is kind of cool. I think that's the only ability like that in the, in the Codex, besides like the Neurothrope. Um, unfortunately, his points cost is where things fall down because he, he this man right here is 220 points, which is not the worst because he is untargetable. So that's fine. But he also doesn't have an invulnerable save. He has minus one damage built in. And as you can see, he has a two plus save here. That's actually the standard profile, those two abilities. That's the standard profile for Carnifexes now. They're T7, two plus save, minus one damage. They're very difficult little guys to shift. Um, but that does mean, because he's gonna be such a high value target, he is just gonna get punched to death on the swing back. And because he's 220 points, you're not that excited about, about making, this, uh, making this trade with this guy. It's, it's a question of whether you take old one eye in your HQ slot, which again is going to be a pretty coveted slot, or you take two other Carnifexes. And I'm a, uh, let me uh, let me blow your mind here, chat. Two Carnifexes is pretty good in this codex. So I think the only thing that, that, that keeps me shying away from old one eye here is probably just his points cost. But his other abilities, just the, the fact that he makes a thousand attacks at pretty high strength, is good you know you can be using voracious appetite on him once he dies you can be using fight on death on him obviously not in the same turn that he already fights but he's just going to be doing a billion attacks and uh i think that's okay he's totally fine uh he's untargetable because he's character keyworded and he's less than 10 wounds chat um he doesn't get bodyguarded from the characters from the uh, carnifexes excuse me but he just gets normal character protection um so just like don't send him out too far I guess he also, uh, he's only move eight, which is a little bit slow for a Carnifex, which is weird to say. Like, what are we talking about right now? We're in insane old crazy land. But uh, he's a little bit slow for a Carnifex and he doesn't have um, access to adrenal glands. So he doesn't get the adrenal gland strat either, which is a little bit unfortunate. All right, so we're moving on. We're in the troops option. Tyranid Warriors, we've already talked about them. They unlock you a free Tyranid Prime. They're Synapse creatures, they're core, they're melee profiles, especially now that we've talked about all of the cool things we can do with Synapse creatures and Synaptic Links. Their melee profile is off the chain. It's in, it's super duper good. These guys are 25 points a model. They interestingly um, have a set cost for their entire unit when they take Adrenal Glands or Toxin Sacks. So to outfit the entire unit with both, it costs you 25 points which means that nine of them with both upgrades and no other abilities is a, a clean 250. And I think that is going to be a pretty common sight in a lot of Tyranid lists. Whether or not you equip those guys with uh, Despiters or Devourers to give them a ranged component, or you just take all melee, I don't know yet. I don't know exactly what the best uh, loadout's going to be. I kind of like Scything Talons because they make a billion attacks. So you're making seven attacks per model, um, which can then be benefiting from, you know, Plus one strength from adrenal glands, the uh, the uh, auto wounding from toxin sacks, all that stuff is going to be triggering off these guys. Um, you can give them, you know, again, plus one to hit from the warlord trait, full rerolls from swarm lord. Their own synaptic imperative can give them exploding sixes. Uh, when they're shooting, the tyranid prime synaptic imperative can give them exploding hits. Those all benefit all of the different kinds of attacks. So what they're going to be doing is making a ton of AP, these AP1 and AP2 attacks, both in the shooting phase and in the fight phase. And then they're going to charge and they're going to do the same thing. Uh, I think Tyranid Warriors are great. I think most lists are going to see one break brick of nine of them. And I think there is a potential that a very viable Tyranid list just turns into 50 Tyranid Warriors. Just here they are. Here's a bunch of them. They're hard to kill. They're toughness five base in, um, they're transhuman in High Fleet Leviathan. So they're difficult to kill there. There's one unit of, of zone throps hiding in the back, giving them a five plus invulnerable save. There's venom throps, making them minus one to be hit. You can give them minus one damage from their own stratagem. You can make them super tough to kill or well, let's not say super tough, but very annoying to kill. And then when they swing back, they have enough punch that they're actually going to clean through you. Um, maybe not 50 warriors, but maybe like 27, three units of nine, and then Swarm Lord to buff them, all the little support units to buff them, and, and they're just rocking across the table doing their thing. I think Tyranid Warriors are phenomenal. All 
All right. We got the Gants now. Termagants and Hormagants. Now, I've um, talked about it a little bit before, but I don't super love Termagants. And that's not because of their profile. So they did get a little bit of a change, uh, a little bit of an update. They went up to a 5-up save, which is nice. There are a lot of ways to give them cover so they can go to a 4-plus save, which isn't, like, super impressive, but it will keep a couple more of them alive. Again, they get Stalwart from... Uh, the High Fleet Leviathan sub-action ability. They get an invulnerable save from Zone Thropes, potentially. So, like, there are ways to keep them alive more so than there were in the previous version. The downside is once we move to this section here and we talk about their points cost. Because sans any other upgrades, they're seven points a model. And in a universe where you're worried about blast weapons and, uh, you know... Farsight Enclaves, Flamer Bombs, and Mass Burst Cannons, and, uh, you know, these Custodes units that are, attack like, making 20 attacks apiece. A Termagant unit just isn't going to stand up that much. And for seven points a model? I don't know if I'm really seeing it. I'm not really... Like, they did certainly go up in value from their previous version, but I don't know if they went up two points per model uh, in value. Especially since we do see a big, huge nerf to their Devourer profile. Their Devourer is now only two shots, Strength 3, no AP. Uh, so they lost a, a shot and a point of strength. If you're taking something like High Fleet Gorgon and you're trying to get that four plus poison to activate as often as possible, then I think the Devourer is like maybe an okay profile. But in other situations, I would almost always take a Flesh Borer because it's one point less. And in a lot of situations, I wouldn't take them at all because I think they're too expensive. Hormagons are similarly expensive, but I think Hormagons have a much different um, use case. So they are uh, eight points a model. So they're a little bit, they're one point per model more. And you will often be wanting to upgrade these guys with uh, either adrenal glands or toxin sacks or both. But the difference is that Hormagants, while well, Termagants are, they're kind of hanging around and, and picking at people with flesh borers. Hormagants want to be that unit that you sink a ton of work into. And then, you know, you, you like a Beyblade, let her rip and they just run across the table, do a billion points of damage and then take some objectives and then all die. So, I do think that there may be a situation where you would take one big unit of Hormagants to use as a focal point for your powers. And again, if you're in a situation where you're not necessarily that worried about your opponent alpha striking you, you can swap into that um, sub-faction ability to give them a six-inch pregame uh, move, and you can be charging deep into their deployment zone on turn one to tie up their ranged attacks. And I think that is potentially very useful. So unlike the term against Hormagants, do have a place and they have their own unique niche that they felt. I don't I don't know if that's the same is true for Termagants. Um, the Hormagan, as we see, got that 5 plus save like we talked about. It went up 2 inches of movement, so 10 inch move. Um, like I said at the very top of the video, a lot of these units got a small buff to their move in order to make up for the loss of double move abilities like uh, uh, Hive Commander and Metabolic Overdrive. So Hormagants went up 1 inch of move. They can take Adrenal Glands for an additional one, plus 1 inch to their move. Then you can use the Stratagem for a 6-inch automatic advance and advance and charge. Uh, alternatively, you can just advance normally and onslaught them. Um, and then you can you can set the Wombo combo off. You can give them uh, plus 1 attack with the Adrenal Gland Stratagem. Costs you 2 CP, unfortunately, but you're getting an additional 30 attacks out of this unit. You can give them plus 1 to hit, full rerolls to hit, exploding 6s, Toxin Sacks for automatic wounding on 6s. Um, and this unit just does a ton of damage they just they attack a million times they're hitting on threes they're rerolling everything they're exploding they're uh, auto wounding and uh it turns out when you make uh 120 attacks with all of those abilities active they're gonna leave a mark on something um their base strength is four at that point as well which is a pretty big deal um but that is 10 points a model for that entire combo plus a bunch of cp so you're going to be spending 300 points to deliver these hormigons to somebody and there is a situation where you go second or you don't have enough space to hide them and they just get vaporized off the table instantaneously um so again i like hormigans but i don't love them and I, that points cost is, you know, it's got to be the reason why. If Hormagons were six points and they buffed up to eight and you're talking about a unit that's 60 points less, I would be so, so in on this unit. But the fact that they're so expensive for a T3 five-up save unit, I just don't love it. I just don't love it. That said, what I do love is Gargoyles because Gargoyles are a troop's choice now. They can be only be taken up to units of 20, but I think that's fine. I think you're going to take units of 10 generally and they're going to be your action monkeys. 
Uh, they're very good at screening because they actually have a very large base size. So the volume of the unit is very big. So they're good at movement blocking. They're good at screening. They're faster than Hormigons. They cost the same as Hormigons uh, because they are eight points a model. Uh, yep, eight points a model for Gargoyles. And they uh, can use the redeploy strat to pull off the table and back into reserve, which means that they, you could potentially just take one unit of Gargoyles, you move up the table on a table edge or something where they're not really intruding on anyone. They're not really fighting in the middle. Um, they just start, re you know, retrieving knock moon data, popping off the table, dropping back, retrieving knock moon data, sending it for a turn, popping off, doing it again. Um, or using the, uh, the spore placement uh, secondary, uh, the Tyranian specific secondary. I think all of those are good use cases for gargoyles. And I think gargoyles are great because this is not a unit that you need to be, um, getting a lot of work out of to get your benefit i think they're just they're just doing their thing they're just uh dropping some objectives down getting some vps i really like them it makes a lot of sense on harry dan too yeah harry dan can definitely deep strike these guys uh or uh, transport them and i think that's also pretty pretty solid as well um they have the new flesh board profile they're only ballistic skill four and if they're in harry dan they're not there to get uh buffed by your synaptic link abilities so it's a little bit less impactful um but on the flip side the strength five AP one. That seems pretty good. Uh, does the new book offer any additional ally options with GSC? Well, it's not. It's just the. There's no specific uh, synergy with GSC. If that makes, if that's the question. Bye bye to sixty hormigons. I think you can still play sixty. Maybe units of twenty is like the way to go, and you and you play them a little bit more. Uh, Cagely, I don't know. Let's talk, talk, let's talk about Toxic Cranes real quick here. Toxic Cranes are really interesting. And one thing that I really like about them is that unlike the previous version of the Toxic Crane, which uh, this is also a very familiar screenshot, and I do apologize for that chat. Um, unlike the previous version of the Toxic Crane, which was very confused in its uh, profile, this one has a very specific niche that it wants to fill, and that is it wants to punch a lot of little men to death and eat them with its big tentacles things. Uh, it has, like the Trigon, 10, 12 base attacks. It's got a huge buff in its survivability. It is now toughness 8 with a uh, with uh, 15 wounds. So it's essentially, it's basically, it's almost an exocrine profile now. Uh, it only moves 8, which is unfortunate, but it does have some other really cool abilities. All of its weapons are 2 plus poison. So non-vehicle, non-titanic, you wound on twos. They're all one damage, which means it's only very good at killing infantry, but it also doesn't care about damage reduction effects. So this thing is actually becomes one of the best units in the game at fighting enemy crusher stampedes, which is pretty funny because it has 12 attacks, two plus, uh, you know, wounding on twos and uh, at AP two, which is all you need against crusher stampede generally. And uh, they, they have a very high conversion rate. Now it also has some pretty cool units. Um, or some pretty cool abilities that, again, are unique to the Toxicran or very close to unique to the Toxicran, which means it's doing its own thing. Like I talked about at the top, you can upgrade this guy to uh, have a six-inch heroic intervention. And uh, because of its toxic or hyper-toxic miasma ability, excuse me, at the start of the fight phase, um, you roll a D6 for units within uh, engagement range of the Toxicran. They, if you succeed on a 4+, they take D3 mortal wounds and then fight last. Which means if you charge into a Tyranid army that's being protected by a Toxicrean, you could potentially heroically intervene six inches with this guy, touch two or three enemy units, and you have a 50-50 shot at fighting last all of them in addition to smiting them. Which is pretty good. I mean, it's very good. Uh, let me Don't get me wrong. He is a little expensive for that. We get to, I think it's 160, uh, 155 base? 150 base plus the Synaptic Link upgrade, so... I think that's 15, so he's 165. He's a little bit pricey for that, but you're still going to get work out of him. And again, toughness 8, 15 wounds, that is a serious defensive profile. Especially when you consider, like, these guys don't have built-in um, invulnerable saves until we start synaptic imperativing them with zone throbs. So zone throbs give any of these monsters a 4 plus invulnerable save. In fact, on turn 1, they give all of the monsters a 4 plus invulnerable save, which is pretty good, or whichever turn you elect to use it. If your opponent's all melee, maybe you do turn 2 and you just totally sandbag their army. Um, they also have a... They, the previous stratagem that Toxicrins had, which... Um, prevented enemies from falling back from them is now just a built-in ability. 
Uh, on a three plus, they prevent anybody from falling back and force them to remain stationary to again, then get hit by their hypertoxic miasma, fight last to get punched. Um, if you're infantry, you get plus one to the, the roll off to uh, try to keep them in melee. Pretty good. Uh, they also now have a spore cloud ability. And again, you can use the um, spore caster stratagem to expand this by six inches. It gives every enemy within the aura. So this one is a three inch aura from this guy that you can expand to nine. It gives enemies within that aura minus one to hit. Uh, Ranged and melee, which is pretty cool. So I don't know if I would love a toxic green and, and specifically because of that one damage. I would, I think I would fall in love with this thing if it was a two damage profile, but the fact that all of its attacks are one damage means that it's only very good against hyper-specific profiles, but you, um, if you are in a metagame with a lot of those profiles, the Toxic Green actually is a very good pick. And, and I think the ability to interact with the fight phase uh, with this guy is actually pretty sweet. All right, let's talk about Tyrant Guard. These guys are kind of blowing people up. Now, most of uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest here, chat. I'm gonna be brutally honest. Most of the Tiger Guard profile here is kind of bad. Uh, they are, if I remember correctly, they're 40 points apiece, which is pretty pricey. When you're considering for 15 points less, you could have a Tyranid Warrior, who's very good. Uh, 15 points less plus um, whatever upgrades you're giving them, but you're you're buying them for a very specific reason. They are uh, they are, they they did get a, a pretty impactful buff in stats. Um, they are toughness six, four wounds now. So they're, uh, with a two plus armor save. So they're significantly harder to kill, much harder to kill. Um, and then they have all of the normal, uh, weapon profiles. You're probably going to be taking them with bone cleavers. I think, uh, is that the case? You can take crushing claws on them, which uh, bump their strength, but I think only cut them at, yeah, they're 10 points a model, which is too, too expensive. I think, yeah, but it keeps them at two damage. Um, and you can you have they have rending claws for AP four and can either have scything talons so five total attacks or bone cleavers to give them two a two damage weapon uh, that's up to you I think um, a two damage weapon and, and reroll ones I'm not sure that their their specific profile matters too much because the reason that you're taking them is this guardian organism ability um, they just uh, get they give bodyguard to hive tyrants that's it all your hive tyrants. Your Swarm Lord, your Flying Hive Tyrants, your Foot Hive Tyrants, all of them, all within three inches of a of a um, Tyrant Guard can't be targeted by range attacks. So it was a big question how they would implement the Tyrant Guard Bodyguard ability with a Hive Tyrant because making Hive Tyrants and targetable by range by ranged attacks would probably be broken, uh, but they just did it, so it's whatever. Pfft, who cares? Um, that's why I said at the top that I think a list focusing on, on Hive Tyrants with maybe one Swarm Lord and two Foot Hive Tyrants or um, uh, a Winged Hive Tyrant and two Foot Hive Tyrants to be able to fight in that sort of mid-board of the table where they're threatening the center of the table with their melee threat range and they're shooting with their guns. Um, that list archetype is going to be successful because you can have that brick anchored around a Tyrant Guard unit that is protecting them all from ranged attacks. You can then be layering your defensive buffs, like your invulnerable saves from uh, Zone Throp, the Zone Throp Imperative, or your uh, you know hit penalties from Venom Throps, which we'll talk about momentarily. You can be layering those all on Tyrant Guard to make that entire castle impossible to move. And I think that this ability alone creates this entire archetype of Tyranid list. Now, obviously, damn it! The bots are back, <laughs> go away. Go away, bots. I've banned so many of you. All right, I think we did. Um, there, there they go. All right, it took a sec. Uh, now, that's that sounds really broken, right? But it's been couched a little bit by the fact that you can only take three type tyrants, and you have to be paying out the nose for CP in order to make that happen. Now, obviously, Hive Tyrants, they're sort of like a, um, a bodyguard battle suit in that most of the indirect fire in the game, and especially, we'll, we'll talk about tyranny indirect fire in a moment here, chat. Don't, don't get me wrong. Um, 
most of the indirect fire in the game is not going to be able to remove these guys in any reasonably effective fashion. They have a two plus save. They're in probably in light cover. They're T6. Most of it's wounding on fives. They're probably minus one to be hit. They probably have a vulnerable save. They might have a damage reduction. Um, Artillery is not going to kill them quickly, which means you have to get through 12 plus wounds of Tyrant Guard before you even think about making an attack against uh, a Hive Tyrant. Um, but again, you're paying 120 points alone for the Tyrant Guard, plus between 2 and 4 CP in order to make that entire combo work. Then you also have to be spending CP to upgrade the Hive Tyrants to make them combat effective. So this combo sounds super duper powerful. I'm not sure entirely how broken it's going to be because the upfront cost is huge. That said, it's cool as hell. So I'm going to play it. I own too many Hive Tyrants. I want to put them on the table. I have a box of Tyrant Guard waiting to be assembled, and I'm very excited. Um, that's all I have to say about that. I think Tyrant Guard are sweet, and I think they're sweet because Hive Tyrants are so good. If they did not have this Hive Tyrant Bodyguard ability, though, this unit would be garbage. I would never play them. Uh, they don't have that many attacks. The attacks that they have are not that impressive, and the, while they are hard to kill, they don't really have any, like, you know, they're just... They're just one dude on an objective. You can give them objective secured with Swarm Lord, and you can, you know, buff them a little bit like that. But I would much rather be spending those those uh, abilities on other units that are more cost effective. That said, I don't know. Hive Tyrants are great. So here we go. Woo! <laughs> Tau picking up their jaw. Yeah, I mean, this ability alone might make uh, Tyranids randomly hard counter Tau. Could you imagine? Could you imagine, chat? Whoa! Probably not. I doubt it. Because the uh, there's no way to increase the aura range of the uh, Tyrant Guard, unlike the Tau Codex, which means the Hive Tyrants are actually going to be like compacted into this little tiny uh, this little tiny area so that the Tyrant Guard don't just get laser cannoned off the table. Um, so I don't... It certainly gives you a fight against, uh, you know, hefty uh, ranged forces, but it doesn't... I don't think it, it immediately breaks the matchup. Once you're committed with those Hive Tyrants, they get shot by Railguns just as much as anybody. And Tyranids no longer really have the reach to catch uh, enemy artillery that's hiding in the back. Um, so if you have a, a, just a dude who's, you know, a Railgun, a bunch of broadsides, a hammerhead that's sitting behind a piece of obscuring terrain in the back of your table, and you're like, I can't shoot anything, so it'll just sit here for a while, Tyranids can no longer go reach out and get that thing. Their ranged weapons are just not that good. Uh, and their threat ranges aren't that long either. They only threaten to the middle of the table. So while they're going to start taking objective points away from you, as soon as those high tyrants leave, you get to kill them. So I don't, like, I don't know if that matchup is particularly one-sided either way. Anyway, let's move on. Lictors, uh, they got their old chameleonic skin back, but otherwise they're kind of bad. Um, they went up to strength seven, but they're still only two damage. They went up a billion points. So they fight first, I guess. That's cool. They have six attacks. That's more attacks than they had. But they're not really doing anything you need Lictors to do. Death Leaper, on the other hand, is sweet. Death Leaper is a sick model. Um, so she has a very similar profile to the Lictors. She's seven attacks rather than six. Strength seven, two damage. Um, she does have flesh hooks, so she gets the uh, the plus one to hit thing if you need it. You don't really need it. But she can jump over obstacles and stuff. Importantly, she has some very powerful um, abilities in the back here. First one, you can't perform actions while you're within six inches of Death Leaper. That's pretty cool. I don't know how impactful it's going to be. There are going to be some actions that you're, you're just going to shut down entirely. Like Marker Lights, for example. You can't shoot Marker Lights where you're near Death Leaper, and that's pretty sweet. Um, I don't know how often you're going to be shooting Marker Lights within six inches of an enemy, but sometimes it might matter. The uh, She's she's relatively difficult to kill. Uh, she's minus one to be hit. She... Um, can't be attacked from more than 12 inches away if she's in cover and she has a four plus invulnerable save. Um, that's all solid at T5, seven wounds. So she's not the easiest thing to kill and she has only 100 points. Uh, but the important one is this fear of the unseen. While she is engaging you, you cannot use stratagems on the unit engaged. Full stop. So for example, if she charges an enemy unit that's on one side of the table or whatever, that's, you know, she's attacking in with another unit. You cannot interrupt with that unit. So, you know, you have an enemy unit on one side of the table. You charge your unit into them. You want to fight first there, but are worried about an interrupt on the other side. Death Leaper's like, don't worry, bro. I got you. I'll charge them. They cannot be selected as the target of the counter assault stratagem. Um, if you have any uh, damage buffing effects, you can't use them. Nothing like that. You, She turns off... Um, 
uh, yeah, she she turns off uh, transhuman. She turns off Emperor's Auspice. Defensive stratagems also turn off. Death Leaper is like insano. She's so good. The awkward part is that she's a little pricey, and she is a character, so she is going to be giving up assassination points, which isn't great. She gives up uh, psychic interrogation, stuff like that. Um, but the fact that she affects both combat stratagems or uh, you know fight phase manipulation stratagems, offensive and defensive stratagems, uh, yeah, she's uh, that's just super utility. I really like this kind of ability on a special character because, um, I guess also, yeah, it is interesting. It says a Death Leaper. Uh, they're considered, I guess, a plural, but you can only have one still, so it is a special character. Um, that is funky. Uh, but I, I like that this is a unique ability that this character has, and not it's not just an upgraded version of another unit. Um, she actually has a, a hyper unique ability that you, you would want to take in specific metagame circumstances. So, for example, I think if you're worried about Adeptus Custodes, Death Leaper, Death Leaper excuse me, could potentially be a really powerful tool in your toolbox because, again, she stops their 1CP interrupt, she stops their 2CP interrupt, she stops their defensive stratagems, and she stops Slayer of Nightmares. All of those turn off as soon as Death Leaper gets near you. And that is sick! Super cool. Woo! <laughs> I love her. The Malice Scepter, unfortunately, didn't didn't uh, fare quite so much, uh, quite so well uh, in the in the the transition here. Can Death Leaper prevent mer emergency disembarkation? No, that's not. Uh... Or I guess when the when the vehicle is destroyed, I highly doubt it, because uh, I don't believe that you select the vehicle as the target of a thing. Let me take a look. Let's see. We're on the we're on the rule book here. Let's take a quick look here. Uh, no, it's just when a transport model is here, it is destroyed. You uh, you don't. It's not choose a transport model when that transport model is destroyed. For example. So I don't believe that you'll be able to do that. All right. Um, let's move on. So we're talking about the Malice Scepter here. Now, the use case of the Malice Scepter in the current version is that it unlocks your use of the Encephalic Diffusion stratagem. And Encephalic Diffusion has gotten a, a, it has changed significantly. Uh, it's now a psychic action. So you do it during your um, psychic phase instead of doing any powers so it turns off all your powers importantly the malice scepter lost its plus one to cast and the psychic action is on a six so you probably have to be buffing it in order to get it off with any reasonable certainty which is not great it's not great that it's going to eat your buffs the buffs potentially that were meant for the onslaught guy um it lost the deny it's cast two and it knows one so or it knows two so it uh it knows a little bit more powers than it did previously, but it's no longer plus one to cast. Its psychic overload ability is much better, though, and I think that's kind of where the Malice Scepter comes into play. This thing just just offloads mortal wounds into your opponent's army. It, it's no longer this defensive tech piece. It now uh, just like sits in the middle of the table and spits mortal wounds at your opponent. So every time you complete a psychic power or action, if you the result is seven or more, you deal mortal wounds equal to the chart, depending on the remaining wounds of the Malice Scepter. So in this case, if it's full bracket, uh, you deal three damage. If it's mid bracket, you deal two. If it's bottom bracket, you deal one. And that's importantly, every single time you roll a seven plus on your psychic test. Now that is including all your benefits. So you could be giving it roll three d6, choose the, uh, pick the two highest for casting. You can be giving it plus one to cast with the Neurothrope, uh, Synaptic Imperative, and uh, I think that's it. So that's the two buffs you can give it. Um, but when you do that, your chances of rolling a seven on, on 3d6 drop to lowest with plus one is pretty high. So you can potentially be spitting out between three and nine mortal wounds from this thing every turn because you can use the stratagem on it to cast plus one, uh, cast additional power. So you can cast a support power, cast another support power, um, smite, and then deal and, and be dealing three mortal wounds from all of those in addition to the mortal wounds that you'd be dealing normally. So if he's like smite, scream, 
I don't know, fucking Cast Catalyst or something, gets three seven pluses. He deals nine plus two D3s mortal wounds or something, so he just blows up a tank with Psychic Powers. That's what the Malice Scepter is supposed to do. The Encephalic Diffusion is identical but you uh, to the previous version, but you do it instead of doing anything else, and it's in your Psychic Phase. This means that you will not have it active if you go second. And that is when you need Encephalic Diffusion the most. Because when you're going first, you're putting up all of your, you know, your defensive buffs and you're putting invulnerable saves on people and you're um, putting up your catalyst and stuff like that. But if you're going first, all you have is your synaptic imperatives to protect you as well as your defensive stratagems. And that's when we needed Encephalic Diffusion. But <laughs> unfortunately, he's like, oh, sorry, boss, I was sleeping. I didn't put my, my Encephalic Diffusion up before the game started. I didn't know they were going to win the roll-off. And, and I, I should have known. I should have known they were going to win the roll-off, and I should have done it before the game. But I forgot, and you'll have to wait till their first shooting phase is over before I can reduce the strength of their ranged weapons. And that's just big sad times. So uh, I guess it's also important to note that the Malice Scepter is way more powerful in melee. Uh, it has the same profile that the Turvagon does. Only three base attacks, but it is base weapon skill three now. And it can double those attacks for two damage profile, so six, or attack at uh, 2d3 at strength 10. So it's much better in melee, which is good because it often just sinks into melee, and it's way harder to kill. It's toughness eight. Uh, with 15 wounds, it still retains that four plus and vulnerable save all the time, so you don't have to buff it. Um, so I wouldn't say the Malice Scepter is like unplayable. I actually think it's pretty good, but it's good in an army where you want to be focusing on these psychic powers. And it's, it's an army where you want to like, I think it's in an army where you have two Neurothropes and one Neurothrope sits in the back of the table and casts Onslaught on a Carnifex every turn. And the other Neurothrope sinks into the Malice Scepter and just tells the Malice Scepter to go absolutely ham on your opponent's army. And I, I feel like that's the, the, the use case for the Malice Scepter. The times where it elects to Encephalic Diffuse are going to be less often. Although you can potentially let it uh, Encephalic Diffuse and still uh, do its regular actions, I believe, in a couple of different ways. So, I don't know. I don't love this guy. I don't know if I'll be playing him outside of, like, some fun lists. Because uh, I don't know if, if trying to deal mortal wounds, a bunch of mortal wounds to your opponent is, like, super duper consistent. But it might end up being consistent. I don't know. Uh, I do like the psychic combo list that this army potentially can assemble, and I, uh, I'd I'm, I'll play it at some point. Whether or not it'll be it'll be a winner, I don't know. Um, here we go, Pyrovores. So we talked about a, a, a unit that may have dropped a little bit in my view of the faction holistically. Let's talk about a unit that probably got the biggest. Um, up the biggest upside from the the, the changeover pyrovores uh were sort of fringe playable to begin with in the previous version of the codex they have um they had a you know a 12 inch range flamer they were one model units which is always valuable in 40k because they can drop on objectives they can screen corners of the table out they can just sort of be annoying for your opponent uh, they can be additional action monkeys because they are infantry keyworded. And they had a gun that was pretty good. They had a 12-inch a, a range, you know, D6 Heavy Flamer, which was all right. Their Heavy Flamer got significantly better, almost literally twice as good. The It now is a, uh, if you fire a Strength 4 pro profile at AP1, it's now an 18-inch range, which means that its movement of 5 doesn't isn't quite as sad as it was previously. Alternatively, it can turn it into a 12-inch range D6 shotgun for strength 6, AP2, 2 damage. 2 damage! It shoots a 2 damage flamer! Uh, it's also, it gained, a, it went up a wound, and I believe a toughness. I think it was toughness 4 previously. It's now toughness 5, and has 5 wounds. Uh, it has a 3 plus save. Uh, it does still explode, and it has the acid mod keyword, which gives it a strat to deal mortal wounds. All of this, chat, for the low, low cost of 30 points... 30 points for this guy that has a two damage flamethrower? This thing is insane. Because specifically it is in one model units, you don't have to take three of them. So the startup cost for this unit is basically nothing. And you get all of the benefits that you used to be able to use it for previously. Doing actions, screening the table, staying on objectives. It does all those and it literally does twice as much damage and is about 30% harder to kill uh, for two points more than it was in the previous codex. I think... I think that we will probably get to a situation with the Tyranid Codex. I'm calling it out here, chat, where every single available elite slot that you have in a Tyranid army 
before you add anything else to your army should be filled by pyrovores. I think pyrovores get to the point that they are like the cyber wolves of the Tyranid Codex, where if you can take them, you should. Um, not because like, I, I don't, you know, a 2d6 flamer, it's good, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna win, win you the game. But for 30 points and a unit that has all these utility benefits already, it's phenomenal. It's super good. It's super duper good. I think pyro pyrovores are absolutely insanely powerful. And I think they are the most improved unit in the Codex, in my opinion. Let's do it. That's what I have to say. Yeah, these guys are awesome. The Haros Packs, we already talked about because we've seen their, their um, uh, data sheet before. They can attack with a D3 plus 3 damage gun or, or a melee attack or make 15 little tiny attacks. That's pretty cool. Unfortunately, they're very expensive and kind of slow. So I'm not super into them. But let's talk about a unit that I am very into. Uh, if you've been watching me play my games recently, I've been playing the crap out of some Venom Thropes, and I swear by them, even in less like Crusher Stampede, that are um, contingent on monsters. And Venom Thropes are sort of like a Pyrovore, except that I was already playing Venom Thropes because they're really good in the 8th edition version of the Codex. Venom Thropes got almost strictly better and didn't really go up any points. They're now, instead of uh, 100 points, they're now 105. They're 35 points a model. But... Um, as we can see, they went up a strength and toughness. All good. They went up a weapon skill, ballistic skill. Actually, almost literally every single stat increased by one or more. Their movement increased by three. Their weapon skill, ballistic skill increased by one. Their strength, toughness increased by one. They went up one wound. They went up three attacks and a saving throw. Every single stat went up, chat. Except leadership, I guess. Who cares? Whatever. You're fearless anyway. Um, their weapons aren't quite as good. They make five attacks a model, but they're only one damage instead of D3. And they're poison instead of rerolling, which is admittedly worse but they do have an ap value so it's kind of a side grade and the the two the i mean the special abilities is why we're taking them they have their no this no fallback ability just like the toxicrine does which is that's nice to have sure it doesn't work on vehicle monsters unfortunately but it does work on infantry they don't get the plus one on infantry but it is what it is um the important thing here is that their Spore Cloud Aura, which again, they can increase by six inches if they use the Spore Caster strat, uh, is no longer contingent on the number of models in the unit. So in the old version of the Codex, if you killed a unit, uh, one Venom Throat out of a unit of three, they would no longer affect monsters. They would only affect infantry. Now you have to kill the entire unit full stop. And it's a unit that you're attacking at plus one save, plus one wound, plus one toughness. Uh, that probably has a stalwart effect from High Fleet Leviathan and probably has an invulnerable save from a, a, a zone throw unit. And is minus one to hit itself because it's uh, <laughs> because it's within six inches of itself. <laughs> oh my god, they're so hard to kill. Um, that's wild. That's just real good. On top of that, uh, they also, their Toxic Miasma has essentially the same effect as the old ver as the, the Toxic Green that we talked about. So at the start of the fight phase, you roll a D6 for each enemy unit within three. On a three plus, they take one mortal wound and they fight last. Boom. If you take the sub-faction ability to give them heroic interventions, you can be armor of rusting people at three inches with this unit. And they're so good. Oh my God. And on top of that, they just randomly have 15 attacks that you can buff with the core keyword. <laughs> Oh, chat. I was already taking Venom Thropes, and now they're like literally light years better. This unit is insane. Oh my god. <laughs> oh man. Good stuff. Woo. Um, how do they work against transhuman? They don't, unfortunately. Transhuman uh, overrides all other abilities. They're Citadel Fine Cast now? They, uh, they're, they're not. No, they're in the same kit as uh, Zone Thropes. You don't have to, to get these guys fine cast. Oh, I think you must be talking, uh, Trooper Trooper, you, you were probably talking about the pyrovores. Yeah, um, I'm 3D printing pyrovores right now, chat. I would, I would do that, I think. Um, so now we can talk about zone thropes. Zone thropes are uh, pretty different than they were previously. It's a, it's an entirely different unit, essentially. And if you take the secondary, the uh, venom thropes can give you a CP. Absolutely, dude, for sure. Um, all right, zone thropes. So I think this unit, uh, I'll, I'll come out with a hot take here, chat. This, I don't know if this unit is very good by itself. 
but its synaptic imperative ability is the most powerful synaptic imperative ability, which means you're going to take these guys in every list. They are fine by themselves. They are really pretty expensive. They're 50 points a model, so 150 for the unit base. But their synaptic imperative is so strong that it's fine anyway, and their other abilities are okay. Now, unfortunately, there's not a huge benefit to taking multiple zone tropes. Uh, you get a bonus to cast your Witch Fire powers, which means your Smites, Psychic Screams, and that new one that they have that I forget and rolls against your toughness value. Every time you Smite, unfortunately, it no longer extends the range of their Smite, so they are just doing a normal 18-inch range Smite. Um, every time you Smite, you get you uh, get plus one to test for each model in the unit. Uh, up to There's no maximum for that, so it's up to potentially six, which is the, up to, the, the, the benefit you get from taking a bunch of zone throbes in one unit. Um, and you get plus one mortal wound on smite for each model in the unit up to three. So a unit of three will smite at plus three for D3 plus three at only 18 inches. That in and of itself is very good. It's not like game breaking for 150 points, but it is solid on a unit that you're already going to be taking to further your synaptic links and to... Um, uh, do the other thing. There is, I think, a typo on this data sheet. They don't have the, the Psyker, or the, the Synapse keyword, but they do have the Synapse ability. And uh, those are generally, uh, 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 I believe that abilities have been referenced as a keyword in other uh, circumstances. So I don't, I think that's a typo. I don't think that changes things significantly. Um... But they might make, it might interact funkily and with uh, with other abilities. That that's probably a I, I imagine that's an oversight that it's it's would be probably probably fine to to ignore. <laughs> oh man! Oh no! Did the the, uh, the bots came back? Get out of here, bots! Um, why ever take six zone throbs? Yeah, it's just because you would uh. You have the units harder to kill, and you get additional on your, your casting smites. Now, important, uh, unfortunately for them, they uh, only get one cast, one deny, regardless of the number of models in the unit. So they're not very good at casting. They cast their one big smite, and they shoot you for D3 plus 3, and then that's it. Fortunately, they are they don't have a 3 plus invulnerable save anymore. They have a 4 plus, but they kind of it's it's been kind of a side grade in their um, resilience because they did get a wound and a toughness each, which feels pretty good for them, I think. Um, this isn't going to be, uh, this isn't like, you know, the zone throw unit of the past where you take like six and you run them in the front of your opponent's army and they can do nothing about them. Um, this zone throw unit is very much going to be more of a support caster. And I think that's a fine place for them to be. It almost doesn't matter what else is on this data sheet because they, you're going to be taking them for the synaptic imperative anyway, as long as they contributed to the game in some way at all, you're going to be taking them for their four plus invulnerable save. And... The fact that they can shoot you for a bunch of mortal wounds is pretty sweet. In addition, they also... Um, I, I think this might also be an oversight as well. Most of the infantry units in the Codex, the specialist infantry units, unlock a free slot for their attendant character. Specifically, Broodlords uh, are unlocked by Gene Stealer units, and Tyranid Primes are unlocked by Warriors. Unfortunately, Zonethropes have it the opposite way, where a Neurothrope unlocks a Zonethrope in an ability on the Zonethrope datasheet, which feels like it's not supposed to be that way. And that might be me wishing that I could take Neurothropes without taking up uh, an HQ slot, because, you know, you know I would, but... Um, it's weird that it's inconsistent with the other abilities. Unfortunately, there's nothing we can do because that ability is, you know, that is what it is. But uh, an, uh, an extra uh, elite slot for a zone throw unit is probably is very useless. It is important to be said too that uh, hive tyrants do unlock a slot for hive guard, so the precedent is there. But um, it is weird that it works the the opposite way of where it should be. Uh, all right, so we'll move to gene stealers. Let's do it. Now, everybody's upset about Gene Stealers not being as good as they were. And let me tell you, chat. Um, 
we are probably going to be taking Gene Steelers regardless of whatever is on this data sheet. Because, let me take you a little gander here to the Vanguard Predator um, ability. So, forward deployment is really good. And that's all I have to say about that. So, the... Gene Stealer profile is significantly degraded from its previous version. They no longer advance and charge. They their melee weapons are a side grade. All of their uh, melee attacks are AP three, and do not have a rending characteristic. Um, and they also don't have acid mods. So essentially, the entire unit has, have acid mods. They don't have options to take scything talons anymore. So um, that's that sucks, but they did go up to four base attacks. They do have a four plus and vulnerable save against melee attacks, but they maintain their five plus and vulnerable save against uh, ranged attacks. And they went up to 16 points model. All of those are not good, but again, they uh, they give you a free broodlord slot. So that's fine, I guess. It is what it is. I don't know if you want to take broodlords. They're kind of bad. That said... I think it all pales in comparison to how powerful the Vanguard Predator ability is in conjunction with the core keyword. And the reason for that is because you can give them buffs on turn one from your Synaptic Links. So if you want to Alpha Strike somebody, you can deploy them out in the open. Um, you can chain a Salat, Synaptic Link to them, give them Objective Secured, full reroll hit rolls, Exploding Sixes, do a bunch of other stuff, and then send them on their way. Whether or not that means that they're going to go fight somebody or whether or not that means they're going to go steal an objective or they're going to engage some guns or do something or perform an action, all of that stuff is important. Even more important is the ability to screen out enemy forward deployers. And for 80 points, the amount of utility you get from this unit being able to sit in front of your army, make sure you don't get killed by a Farsight Enclave's uh, Doom Drop on turn one, and then... Um, alternatively you know in other matchups where you go first or where you're not worried about that they go do other things i think gene stealers are going to be in a lot of competitive armies for specifically those reasons and that's what i have to say about that i think gene stealer their profile sucks but the special ability that they got is so powerful i think you're going to take them regardless and that's that's what i got uh the acid my keyword gives you a strat to um let me go find it real quick uh, it gives you a strat to deal mortal wounds when you're selected to fight. I think it's you, you roll a dice for each model with the acid maw, and it gives it deals a mortal wound for uh, on a three plus. Uh, it is um, you roll a dice for each acid maw infantry in the unit in engagement range of the enemy unit you're engaged with, and on a three plus they. Um, deal a mortal wound it's not a good stratagem but if you need to deal one mortal wound somewhere it's fine uh i would generally kind of ignore it you can also probably ignore their like infestation node ability you can when you forward deploy you can infestation node out and the infestation nodes give your opponent an action to um or they they they're destroyed if enemy units walk within three inches but if you're within three inches you can regenerate guys unfortunately there's no there's no universe where a gene stealer unit's like standing out in the front of your army and take casualties and doesn't die if they're doing their turn one screening or move movement blocking they're just dead so that's fine but for 80 points i think that's worth it and that's all i have to say about gene stealers i think gene stealers are significantly worse than they were in the past but i think that they are good enough that you'll still take one in most armies All right, let's move on. A different unit that is kind of like Gene Stealers, but better in every way, is the Ravener. Because the Ravener might be... I talked about uh, the Pyrovore being the most glowed up unit in the Codex, and I think that, might, that that's wrong. I think it is. it might actually be the Ravener, because Raveners are insane. So the first thing to keep in mind about this unit chat is while we're talking about them is that these are 30 points a model. So they are five points more than a Tyranid Warrior. And for that five points, unfortunately you lose some stuff. They're not troops options. Those, they're not naturally objective secured. Um, they um, don't have access to two damage weapons and they don't have... Um, 
access to uh, toxin sacs or adrenal glands. But uh, to be fair, those also cost the warriors quite a bit. What they get instead is double the movement. They're move 12 instead of move six. They are still strength five, toughness five, but get an additional wound. They're four wounds a piece. They get minus one to be hit in melee. And they can have built-in reroll ones to hit, although it doesn't, that's not going to matter. We're not going to do that. They're core keyworded, and they're fast as hell. So this is the unit that we're going to be using to chain Onslaught onto and then Alpha Strike our opponent to death. Because a lot of times what we're going to be doing is taking a unit of nine of these guys. We're going to be putting guns in their in their, bot, in their chests. We're going to scoop out their chest cavity and throw a Death Spitter in there because the Death Spitters are free like they are in the current version. Um, you just re you just give up your reroll once to hit, which doesn't matter because Swarm Lord is going to be telling them to be objective secured, rerolling their hit rolls, and then we're going to use a Warlord trait to give them plus one to hit. So they're going to be advancing up the table, get onslaught to advance and shoot without penalty, shooting twenty seven attacks, hitting on twos, winning on whatever, who cares, and then charging with uh, base five attacks plus two for scything talons, seven attacks apiece, hitting on twos with full rerolls. Oh, this unit's so good. Um, and that's all for less points or similar points you would you would spend on an equivalent warrior unit. So basically, compared to warriors, they take their gun without giving up any of their melee attack profiles, and they double their movement. And that's it. So that's pretty good. Um, picking the guns outside of the torso replaces the claws, but data sheet doesn't make you lose the claws. Yeah, no, you lose the, uh, yeah, you lose the, um, this ability right here. The claws are meant to, like, I guess represent that ability, but it's whatever. It doesn't really matter. So anyway, this unit's insane. I think this might be the most improved, to be fair. Uh, Ripper Swarms are also here. They kind of suck but they are spawned by a bunch of different things. So I think most of the time when you use Ripper Swarms, you're going to be using them for free and not paying points for them, um, which I think is fine for Ripper Swarms, to be fair. Uh, the Parasite of Mortrex is pretty good. A Rending Claw is better than the Scything Talon. Strength 6 is a big break point. AP 1 is sad into many things. Um, maybe. Uh, mass Attacks is good, but I guess the... Um, they don't get toxin sacks, which is usually where I'm trying to push the maximum number of attacks. So rending claws might be better. You might be right, chat. But regardless, like this unit is making between eight and ten attacks at strength between five and six, AP one to three, or AP one to four. Like it attacks ten times. They attack ten times model for thirty for thirty points. So this unit is just gonna like it's just a boatload of wounds. That's thirty six wounds for the full unit. Um, with a reroll, you can spend, um, you know, with the uh, Stalwart for Leviathan, with all of the, the uh, invulnerable saves on them, uh, minus one to be hit from, uh, in shooting from Venom Thropes and in melee from their own ability. It's just, like, annoying to kill for 270 points, and they make a thousand attacks. A million, million attacks. I think these ones are awesome. Um, the Parasite of Mortrax... We've seen this, uh, uh, I mean, most of the stuff we've seen already, we've seen uh, a lot of their melee profile. Uh, one thing that's interesting, which I think caught me totally off guard and people were talking about earlier today, was that uh, it's apparently not a special character. A, a parasite of Mortrax can be taken multiple times in, the, in your army. So you can just take three of these things, which is makes the parasitic infection ability much more interesting. In my head, that was always a thing that could be like, you would, it was a one and done, and then the Parasite of Mortrax would probably die and you wouldn't get it again. But if you have three of them, and they can use the Dive Bomb stratagem to be uh, infecting people outside of melee, um, these things are actually going to be pretty sweet. They also have the, the, the um, Harlequin's effect, where they can't, uh, they're minus one to be hit and they can't be re-rolled against. So they're very, they're relatively difficult to kill, um, unless you have like a boatload of attacks, in which case you'll probably kill them pretty easily. Because they're not that, like their, their defensive profile is not all that. Uh, they also... Um, don't have an invulnerable save built in. So if you can um, ping them for too much, they'll just go down really quickly. That said, uh, with the character keyword, you can make them kind of like a decent utility option because they can 
they don't take up an HQ slot and they can be delivering your auras around as a unit, like a very fast synapse unit that can complete your synapse chain, yeah, your uh, synaptic link chain. So while they don't really do much, that much damage, and I'm not sure how much, how powerful they'll be uh, from that respect, they are sort of annoying to kill and they can just sort of sit in the middle of your army and be untargetable and uh, provide this kind of important uh, utility ability. Whether or not that's worth, uh, I think they're 80 points a piece. Is that right? They are 80 points a piece. Whether or not that's worth 80 points, I don't know. But uh, I think it's they're probably fine. Whether you take multiple, I don't know. I think there's a, certainly an argument to be made for it. But uh, the one damage is going to hose you eventually. You can have more than one. Yeah, chat. Yeah, chat. It's not. It's a character, but it, it doesn't have the uh, the special ability there. Characters. The character keyword just gives you the ability to take warlord traits and stuff and be untargetable. But um, like you know, a bunch of stuff has characters. A regular space marine lieutenant has a, is, has a character keyword, but that doesn't mean that space marine lieutenant is a special guy. Yeah, the dive bomb strategy is also pretty good for them, for sure. Yeah, their synaptic imperative is an additional three inches on piling consolidate, I think, which is also pretty good. All right, so we'll move on to the Moloch. We're getting we're getting down towards the end here, chat. We're almost done. Don't worry. Um, the Moloch is a uh, pretty wild, pretty wild dude. Uh, it has, I think, the highest number of attacks in the Codex. 16? 16 attacks? Huh. Huh. That's a lot. Um, they are only AP 1, 1 damage attacks, but it does get a weapon skill 3 now instead of weapon skill 4, which is nice. It has the Trigon profile, so it's uh, 14 wounds with T7, and it's minus 1 to be hit in melee. Also very nice. The reason you're here, though, is for this Terror from the Deep thing. And this is actually a pretty weird ability now. It's... Uh, I don't really know how to judge this one because it's so it's changed so significantly from the um, from the previous version. So essentially, you now declare where Molochs are coming up in your command phase. They then reinforce in your re your next re the reinforcement sec step of your next turn. So on your first command phase, you can have the Molochs in in deep strike uh, because of death from below. Your first command phase, you say, I'm going to bring up this Moloch here, and then nothing happens. You, you put a marker down, and your opponent is just notified. You basically then orbital strike that location, and the Moloch pops up within 12 inches of it. So it's not tied down specifically to where you pointed, but your opponent does take mortal wounds for standing within 6 inches of that point. So... Uh, it's also important to note that the Moloch uh, just it can't be at inside engagement range of enemies. So, you know, like the previous version where you use him in Crusher Stampede to pop up on objectives and put a bunch of um, a, uh, a bunch of uh, wounds, model count wounds for holding objectives there. You can potentially take the sub-faction ability where your monsters get objective secured and you can be popping this guy up outside of an inch of enemies and obsecking their objectives away. Uh, he doesn't... Oh, he counts as five models, I think, if you take that that secondary um, or that, that sub-faction ability, which is... That's a cool combo. In addition, if you decide to place him outside of nine inches of enemies, because remember, you put the point down and then he comes in within 12 inches of that point. So you have this 24-inch, you know, basically this big uh, section of the table that that Mala could point, could come up in. I guess he, like, he like drive-bys the, the, the place where you, you pointed. You're like, he's coming in somewhere over here and he comes up and he eats people and then he, like pieces out somewhere else um but if you pop up outside of enemy models he can charge that turn so potentially you can be using your abilities like your um shard lure and the other abilities that you have to bone buff your charge uh distances to try to get him into melee that turn otherwise if you're within nine inches of enemies you can't you can't charge how good are rippers uh i think they're only good when you spawn people for sure So, I don't know how to um, evaluate this guy, to be honest. Chat, I think the ability feels kind of gimmicky, but I, definitely the the uh, ability to obsec the Moloch and then pop him up on objectives is pretty good. And the melee profile is not too bad, especially if he doesn't take too much damage on the way in. 16 attacks is a lot of attacks. That's a ton, especially because he hits on threes now. So, I don't know. It seems fine, I guess. 
Uh, he also is, his Jaws ability is no longer a big attack that he makes. He just deals mortal wounds in the fight phase, which is pretty good. And then he uh, forces some uh, combat attrition penalties on those people. Uh, we can move on here a little bit. Uh, the Exocrine, I think, is one of the uh, units that I talked about right at the top of the video is being super duper powerful. I think Exocrines are phenomenal. Exocrines are, have, have become or, are, or have uh, returned to being the gold standard of Tyranid damage output in, in the shooting phase. They unfortunately got a little bit of a nerf in that they no longer double tap their gun, but their gun does significantly more damage on the initial shot. It's D3 plus six shots. It's, it is a blast weapon, so they can't fire into melee. But... They have a base 3 plus ballistic skill, and they don't need to stand still to, to do all their benefits. Instead, they um, if they stand still, they ignore cover, full stop, light heavy cover, light and, and dense cover, excuse me, when they shoot their gun. Uh, and, and it's only if they uh, move less than half of your movement characteristics. So if they move four inches at their top bracket, then they will still ignore cover. Or you can use the observer uh, organism to just let them do that and explode their sixes normally. Then you can use um, the uh, Tyranid Prime Synaptic Link, as long as they're shooting something within 24 inches, to also explode, or Synaptic Imperative, excuse me, to also explode their sixes additionally, which means your Exocrines could be Tesselling sixes uh, if you combo those two abilities together, which is pretty good. But just in general, this thing is T8, 15 wounds with a two plus save. It's a very similar monster profile to what we've seen before, but it's just like chills around. You can upgrade it with the, the four plus um, invulnerable save, either with zone thropes or with Dermic Symbiosis. And it just kind of waddles around and shoots between seven and nine thunder hammers at people, which is a pretty freaking good offensive profile. And I'm into it. Uh, that's all I had to say about this guy. He's 170 points, so he's the same as he used to be and does drastically more damage and takes significantly less babysitting. Uh, unfortunately, he is not core keyworded. Most of the, uh, all of the monsters we've talked about so far have not been core keyworded, which means he doesn't benefit from all of the links. So the links will be focused on the melee units like Warriors and Raveners and Gants that we've talked about, but the Exocrine just kind of chills in the back. He gets synaptic imperatives, and he just fires a bunch of you know, big gunshots at people. I think they're great. I like these guys. Um, Biovores? I don't know. Uh, they're kind of interesting. We do have to talk a little bit about Spore Mines specifically. Uh, spore Mines work almost the same way that they do in the current version, except they do have a rule that says that they, A, do not screen for Deep Strikers. Uh, they obviously are discounted for scoring objectives, and they can be moved through as long as your opponent doesn't land on top of them, which means that um, spore mines are significantly less useful at, at movement blocking and deep strike blocking, which means the ability to generate spore mines is pretty garbo. Um, Biovores can do that much more, uh, consistently now because they have an action that in the shooting phase, it just takes their shooting phase. Once they're done, they just spawn D3 spore mines anywhere within their weapon range outside of six inches of enemies. So that's pretty good. You know, they'll just create them and then say go uh the spore mines do explode at the end of your opponent's movement phase so if they move you know over them and uh end within three then they'll still get pinged and they usually ping for one mortal wound um the downside though is that their launcher uh it now shoots d3 times but if they miss with it nothing happens and they're unfortunately not core keyworded and also didn't get a buff to their ballistic skill so it's a 50 50 to do anything with the weapon if they hit they just take a mortal wound you don't have to roll to see if the spore mine's a dud or anything which is pretty nice but <sighs> they probably will only be shooting in the situations where they can shoot and also perform their action at the same time if they can do that, they can be dropping spore mines and shooting spore mines at people, so the mortal wounds are just sort of on, you know, it's a cherry on top. But generally, you want to be you want to be in a situation where you can sort of crowd your opponent's charge, you know, zones and stuff like that to try to make them pre prevent them from charging you. And if you're able to do that, uh, the biovores are going to be pretty useful for 50 points a model or 45 points a model. I think they are. I don't know if that's entirely worth it. Yeah, 45 points model. I thought for a brief shining moment that they uh, still prevented deep striking, and I thought that biovores were phenomenal because you could automatically place these deep striking spore mines everywhere. Can't do that, though. They don't stop deep striking at all. So less good. Less good. I don't I don't know if I particularly rate biovores, unfortunately. Uh, let's talk about a unit that I do particularly rate, and that is the Carnifex. 
Now, there's three versions of the Carnifex, right? There's uh, Screamer Killers, regular Carnifexes, and Thornbacks. I think the standard Carnifex, and, and this is probably... We could almost go go back verbatim to our the Carnifex video. The, the Carnifex video that I did. The, the data sheet deep dive I, I did on Carnifexes, where I compared all of the different kinds of Carnifexes. And uh, a lot of the things I said in that are, are pretty, pretty much the same. The regular Carnifex is very um, uh, flexible, but it's kind of a jack of all trades, master of none. The Thornback Carnifex is the slowest one, but it is better at shooting because it does uh, have an ability to ignore cover, ignores light cover, and uh, it has uh, rending on sixes or blade artists on sixes. Um, which is pretty good. Uh, you can't take the spore cysts on any of these, or on the, um, Thornback Carnifexes, which now only give you light cover. So it's significantly worse, but that does mean that there's no score energy with taking Venomthropes. So if you already have Venomthropes in your army, you're probably going to want them to protect your Carnifexes. I'm actually not sure if I would ever take the regular Carnifex these days, because... The, the, the big upside of the regular kind of effects is that they're they're kind of fast, they have decent melee profile, and they can take a big gun and swords. But that's okay. If you want guns, the Thornback Carnifex is a little bit better because of the special abilities that it has. But if you want melee attacks, holy shit, let's talk about the Screamer Killer Carnifex! This guy's so insane! Um, so this, the, we can take a look at the base, the Carnifex profile here, right? So he's got their T7. Uh, and a 2 plus save. We talked about that with Old One Eye. They have 9 wounds apiece, and unfortunately, they, they retain the Vehicle Squadron role. Although, to be fair, if they didn't have Vehicle Squadron, they would be sort of insane-o. Uh, they also get plus 1 attack when they charge, which is pretty nice. That's a nice bonus. But they're all they're always uh, 3 plus weapon skill. The most important part about this profile, though, is this little section right here. Look at this gorgeous four-letter word on top of the Carnifex keyword stack here. They are core keyworded. <laughs> Which means that the play pattern for this unit is going to be to, like, bring a brick of three or whatever. They deploy and split into three. You, after you've done doing your thing with warriors and raveners and whatever else you're doing, if you need something to explode, you put, you, you just angle all the buffs into one Carnifex. You make him go absolutely apeshit. And then you reroll wounds with Voracious Appetite and you obliterate it you turn it into a fine powder uh, and all of that if we're talking about a screamer killer card effects for 125 points once they're upgraded so let's talk about the profile of this guy specifically um obviously the regular card effects can do similar things but he, he's paying a little bit for the ability to take both melee and range weapons you can take i think like a stranglethorn cannon or the uh, uh just taking venom cannons on these guys doesn't feel too bad like that gun is pretty solid for a unit um, that you're going to be upgrading what uh, ballistic skill on and especially if you have like the high fleet leviathan hit, like reroll one hit roll that makes them pretty consistent so i don't i don't dislike that i think that's probably pretty viable but i also think that using screamer killers as uh, like intercontinental ballistic uh screaming monsters then is that's probably fine so here we go so the screamer killer has a base profile of 10 attacks pretty good uh, if we compare that to the regular uh, Carnifex, the regular Carnifex comes in at four, but its Scything Talons give it a uh, plus one attack per Scything Talon. So it comes with four Scything Talons, and, and we should mention as well, these are 100 points base. So for 100 points base on a regular Carnifex, you move eight, you make four attacks base, four from your Scything Talons, one for charging. So you're making nine. A Screamer Killer one-ups you on that. He makes 10. The the, web, the the talons don't do anything else, but you do get plus one to charge. So you're making 11 attacks on the charge. We can then combo these out. Swarm Lord can give us uh, full rerolls to hit, or we can give ourselves plus one to hit with the Warlord trait and then uh, reroll ones to hit if we want to. We can have exploding sixes to hit with the um, Warrior Synaptic Imperative. We can also be plus one uh, strength. So we go from strength six to strength seven, which is pretty good. We're going to be winning most of the game on fours. We can Voracious Appetite to full reroll that, and we can use the Adrenaline uh, uh, Gland uh, Stratagem to get an additional D3 uh, uh, melee attacks. So <laughs> we're, making, uh, we're making 11 attacks plus D3, so between 12 and 14. Hitting, most likely hitting on twos full rerolls, winning on fours full rerolls at AP3-3 damage. 14 attacks at AP3-3 damage, and this guy 
upgraded with adrenal glands. So the single upgrade that we put on him costs 125 points. He moves 11 inches, and once you onslaught him, he advances and charges. So he threatens somewhere in the realm of 22. So I'm going to take like five of these things, I think. And I think that's that's what we do. I think the Screamer Killer profile is awesome. It will you you'll lose a couple on the way in, although they are two plus save, minus one damage, and they have a, they'll have an invulnerable save from a venom throat. But the fact that you can you can just trade them one for one with enemy units is freaking insane. Like this guy will go into a unit of Virtus Praetors, and you know maybe you have Death Leaper in there, maybe they're out of CP because I, I don't think they they don't alpha very well. They they're a beta straight kind of unit. You want a, a Raffiner unit or something to alpha with you. Um, if they don't have a ton of CP to spend, that dude will just kill that unit. They're just dead. He will trade up three times his points once all that whole combo is assembled. Uh, and if you have, and, and you know, for 125 points a piece, you can take four or five or six of these guys in your list for sub, you know, six or 700 points. The Screamer Killer Carnifex is the future, chat. Yeah, they also explode. And they, uh, they death throws explode, so they only hit an enemy unit. Boo! They shoot one enemy unit when they die instead of exploding. Yeah. Yeah, so that entire combo, it takes a psychic power, it probably takes a couple synaptic link abilities, and it takes two CPs and stratagems. And once you do it, uh, they'll just kill a, a million points. So, yeah, I don't know. I love these guys. I'm really glad I have a bunch of uh, Scything Talent Carnifexes in my in my house because uh, I'm, we're going we're gonna to refurbish those boys and we're going to start playing them. I think the, the gun Carnifexes are pretty good. The Thornbacks, unfortunately, are very slow, so you want to generally take them with a bunch of guns, but uh, it kind of takes a lot of points to upgrade them. Um, I think the Thornback build, they're 115 base. You want to take Enhanced Senses and a... Uh, I guess just the Enhanced Senses, so you're up to 125. So I guess it's the same between the, the Thornbacks and the Screamer Killers, but the Screamer Killers are faster and are going to do more damage when they go in. Although they do less damage over time, obviously. Um, now, obviously, if you wanted to go like full Carnifex, you could you could supplement your plus one to hit guy with uh, the old one eye. He could just do that. Um, and you could just be rerolling ones from a Hive Tyrant plus, uh, plus one to hit from old one eye and you're good right there. Uh, unfortunately, Old One-Eye doesn't have that same level of synergy because he's, again, he's almost twice the cost of a Screamer Killer. He has a similar number of attacks, although his attacks are admittedly a little bit better. And, but he doesn't get the benefits from the Synaptic Links and stuff, which is unfortunate. Um, so yeah, I'm all in on, on Screamer Killer's chat. Uh, I made a short about Hiveguard. Uh, Hiveguard got <laughs> absolutely dumpster. <laughs> um... They're, the big thing here, I think, is uh, their Impaler Cannons um, now have a very fluffy and actually uh, an ability that I'm a huge fan of. They can only target enemy units out of line of sight if a, a High Fleet Synapse model has line of sight to them. So you need a spotter for them. And if you have a spotter for them, they ignore line of sight and they ignore cover, which is super cool. I love that. The downside is that their attacks are only 24 inches range, which is terrible and not good. Um, they did get an additional attack with the Impaler Cannons. Um... So they're strength six, AP two, two damage, three shots apiece. But the downside is that 24 inches and requires line of sight means they can only shoot stuff in the center of the table, which you might as well be shooting with exocrines anyway, because exocrines are more efficient than this unit. These units are, these models are 60 points apiece. They lack the core keyword, so they're not going to be getting rerolls or buffs anyway from your synaptic links. So for 10 less points, you get an exocrine that makes a same number, like the similar number of attacks at uh, plus two strength, plus two AP, plus one damage. Just take exocrines. Uh, people are talking about the shock cannons. They're like, hey, it's strength seven, it's three damage. Literally compare a shock cannon to an exocrine and you'll feel sad and, and want to play exocrines more. Similarly, unfortunately, exocrines are just blowing all of these range attacks out of the water, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, you think the cost of the combo might end up being too high for the screamer killer chat? No, no, no. It's not that expensive. Um... You're taking uh, a you're so for, for the for the full combo. You're taking a warlord trait, which you can have on your neurothrope if you want to. You're taking the swarm lord, who you're probably having. You're probably taking already. He can also give them obsec because they're core keyword. That's the other important thing of, out of the uh, the scrimmer killer combo here. So once you're rocketing that dude in, uh, you can objective secure him. 
You can also take, if you're taking a billion of them, you can take the sub-faction ability to objective secure them, which I think you can take on, on Behemoth, which gives them plus one strength on the charge, which is also very good. So I think like that combo is also sweet. Um, so you're taking Swarm Lord, who you're probably going to take anyway. You're taking a unit of Tyranid Warriors, who you're gonna, probably going to be taking anyway to give them Exploding Sixes. And you're taking any character with a Warlord trait, which is probably either your Tyranid Prime, who can also give them reroll ones to hit, uh, reroll ones to wound if you want, or you're taking it on your Neurothrope. Um, so like, I, in my opinion, this entire faction is based around the idea of putting, uh, you know, of sinking every buff into a unit literally like doubling their damage output and then rocketing them off at an enemy unit and then just doing that over and over again those costs in 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 my opinion are sunk into the design of the faction so you know being like well it's too expensive because you have to take swarm lord well i'm gonna take swarm lord anyway this guy just happens to be one of the most efficient delivery systems for full rerolls that i have because he has a billion three damage attacks you could take a Lictor as well for plus two on the charge. I mean, I guess. <laughs> Maybe we're doing Death Leaper. Maybe we do Death Leaper. Um, all right. So we're moving on. Uh, we're talking about how good Exocrines are. I think you probably start most of your list with one or two Exocrines. Probably one. I like one so far. Maybe two. Two feels like your opponent then just starts dodging them and they don't do that much damage, but I'll have to see. The other thing is that once you put too much into them, um, you want to start... Oh, that, that Screamer Killer also has a gun, by the way. It has a D6 shot strength eight gun that you're going to be advancing and shooting because you're onslaughting them um whatever it's pretty good the um you you might want to be switching into the fallback and shoot sub faction ability when you're taking multiple exocrines because they are a single blast weapon so they can't fire into melee which is unfortunate the other thing that's unfortunate is what's happened to my poor terrain effects boy right here he does have the turvagon profile so he went up to t8 17 wounds of the two plus save which is a difficult profile to shift Unfortunately, he also is going to have trouble shifting enemy units because all of his guns got way crappier, which sucks. Uh, on the on the uh, the surface, they look pretty good. The acid sprays firing 18 inches, D6 plus six attacks, strength six, AP three, two damage. Um, but the one thing that we'll notice down here in the ability section is that he's lost his ability to double tap. So all of his weapons bumped up about 30% of their damage output, and then he lost an entire shooting activation, which means he lost on, on the whole uh, about 40% of his damage output. Is that how math works? 35%? I think that's a little bit closer. So the acid spray... It went up two points of AP. If we ca if we consider AP two to AP to or damage two, excuse me, to D three damage as being relatively the same, they're not. Damage D three is better, especially if you had reroll damage rolls available for them. The they're bat, they're back. Get out of here. Go away, chats. You're the worst. All right, we fixed it. Um. So. We went from doing two D6 shots twice to doing D6 plus six once, but with initial two AP with the acid spray. Their Singer Salvo went up uh, four shots, so it's now shooting eight times, and they're obviously their ballistics go went up. The Rupture Cannon uh, now does more damage, but again, only shoots three times instead of six. Uh, and the Flesh Borer Hive used to shoot 20 times, and now she's only 30. I think... I don't know. I think I... Maybe there's a place for the Rupture Cannon. I kind of doubt it. I don't think its profile is very good. I think the Acid Spray is where you live still. And even then, um, it's it also went up in points for some reason. People heard me talking too much about how much I love Terran effects is in the current version. And unfortunately, they, uh, I don't know, they, they point costed them like through the roof. So they went up to 170 points with the Flesh Borer Hive build. They'll go up to 175 with the Acid Spray, so they're 15 points more than they were in the previous incarnation, and they do significantly less damage. So, the, But on the flip side, they are much tougher to kill. So if there's a universe where Crusher Stampede remains legal and this Terran effects is like you can, you know, you're playing a Terran effects with a sick and vulnerable save and he just chills in the middle of the table and has a million wounds. Um, I think that's that's the instance in which you take a Terran effects. Questions to be answered at the end must include not build around units. Where does Harry Dunn stand? If both supplements are null, what tier would you put this codex? 
Brandon Carver, thanks so much for uh, for the super chat, dude. I will cover those at the end. Yeah, we're we're getting close. We got a couple more data sheets to cover real quick, and then we'll we'll go ahead and talk about those. The six pyrovores are cheaper than this guy. Yeah, the six pyrovores again are are, are much e you know much easier to kill for sure. Um, but uh, so yeah, I don't know. I think this dude, his life depends on Crusher Stampede, in my opinion. I don't think he's good enough without it. Uh, but if he's, you know, counting his ability and wounds for holding objectives and, you know, gets objective secured and all that stuff, then I think he's probably playable. It is super unfortunate, though. All right. We'll talk about some uh, aircraft. The Hive Crone is relatively unchanged. I'm actually just, I think, going to skip her because she's kind of shooty. She's, she gets plus one to hit against Fly and has a bunch of terrible guns. But the Harpy is the one that's actually really good. Uh, if you were alive in the times of uh, Admex X-Plane, you know that how terrifying the Archaeopter Fuselov is. And uh, may I introduce you to Archaeopter Fuselov 2.0. The Harpy is literally almost exactly just an Archaeopter Fuselov, full stop. It's, it has the same bomb ability. So after you move over something, you roll uh, dice equal to the number of models up to 10 on a four plus, they take a mortal wound. If they are vehicles or monsters, you roll 6d6. And you, alternatively, you can also just choose to set up spore mines instead of dropping a bomb. So they just it just gets a spore mine unit every turn, even if you're not bombing someone. Uh, pure value. It also has two heavy, it can take two heavy venom cannons for 170. And it has the uh, maneuverable pivot. So it pivots uh, when it moves and then once during its move. And it's only a 15 inch base move, although it's maximum move is a little bit shorter. So this thing is like just, it's just super good. Um, I think it'll probably be a little while until people start playing it in big numbers because I think people are, I mean, like personally, I'm more excited about playing Screamer Killers and stuff. And I think a lot of people are. So whether or not we see Harpies immediately, I don't know. And also the metagame right now isn't super conducive to being bombed. Like you're you're talking about hitting, you know, like Harlequin transports and, uh, I, like I guess yeah, I don't know, like like units of six crisis battle suits or something, uh, and then you're next to them and they'll sh and they'll shoot you to death. But and, and custodians don't really care about this thing whatsoever besides the, the direct fire shooting. Um, but that said, if we get a situation where there's more volume of infantry on the table that 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 mortal wound effect is really strong against harpies are going to be seen everywhere they are super duper good they also got uh importantly they got uh classic or the classic aircraft now so they actually they don't uh, hold objectives anymore and they also got the ability where they can charge other aircraft when they're when they're not hovering otherwise when they hover they uh they just move 15 inches like normal yeah you can only play two now for sure i agree that's uh, because they are aircraft keyworded. Although I, I don't know if you would play more than two, to be fair. Anyway, like you, even pre aircraft keyword, you are you're only gonna, you, you could only take three, and I don't know if you take three of these. But two, you you would certainly take, I think, especially because they're three plus web, uh, three plus ballistic skill, and have the new venom cannon profile. So three shots, strength nine AP, three four damage. Um, like that's just better than a hive tyrant shooting, right? Uh, I do have the Sporo Cyst and stuff. Unfortunately, the Tyrannocyte um, data sheet did not upload very well. <laughs> so uh, I actually don't know what its abilities are on the Tyrannocyte data sheet. Uh, so I can't tell you too much. I think... Uh, I, I, I don't know. So that, that one we'll have to skip over for now, although I'm sure somebody has a, a better a quality pick that they can show you if you want that specifically. Um... The Sporo Cyst is, uh, I don't know, he's a big dude. <laughs> he's, uh, um, he's no longer a fortification, interestingly. Uh, he's just a monster. Uh, is he, uh... oh, he is a fortification. Oh, he's fortification BFR, but he's not keyworded. Okay, well, I'm confused now. Oh, yeah, he's, yeah, okay. So he is a fortification. So he sets up instead of a terrain feature, probably. Um, he's got a funky action to um, create spore mines. Um, they go kind of far away. They go 18 inches away, which is kind of cute. But generally, the problems that have sort of plagued the spore assist already are, are not great. 
Um, it does also... Uh, it bounces your synaptic links, which is kind of cute because he gains the synapse keyword, so you can bounce synaptic links through him, which is all right. Uh, but he's 10 wounds, the four plus save, which means he's going to get shot and blown up like immediately and give up two points on bring it down. Um, and they're only a five plus ballistic skill. The ability to spawn mines is cute, but as we talked about, the mines don't movement block quite as well anymore. If your opponent's spraying a bunch of big models, this guy will be kind of a nightmare because he'll just keep dropping uh, spore mines on them. But otherwise, I don't know. Tyrannocyte is basically unchanged, but can deep strike turn one like a drop pod. Ooh. That's interesting. I wonder what you drop out turn one of it with it. Uh, maybe the strain effects. <laughs> is there a wounds cap? Is, can somebody tell me if there's a wounds cap on the, uh, on the transport capacity? I think I saw somewhere that uh, it's it's... 18 three wounders or 21 wounders for infantry but i don't know about um i don't know about the other guys uh, about uh monsters just wait till somebody puts one behind and outputs 40 spawn lines on an objective well the problem is that it, it being fortification um, it can't place near the L, right? Because it has to be three inches away. So it it's hard to hide, and it's hard to put in like a, a situation where it's like super easy to get to. It's up to seventeen for the monsters. Okay, so it can it can carry the big guys. So uh, um, like a, a Tyrant effects in the in the in the drop pod could be cool. Um. I guess you could also just drop an exocrine, right? Because you're going to be dropping using the targeting ability on it anyway, and then you can use it to drop out of like in in alternate lines of sight. I think that's probably the best is if because exocrines no longer get like hosed if they uh, if they come out of a transport because they don't care about moving and shooting really. They just ignore dense cover. Uh, so I, but so you can get really oblique angles with a turn one d deep strike. God, I hate turn one deep strike. So chat, I wish they weren't in the game. I kind of don't like that Tyranids would have one. Uh, the Tyrant effects can't go in it. It's just the well. Then I, I guess it's just exocrines. Then we just do everything with exocrines. Um, Its restriction is 12 inches away from enemy deployment zone and models, but that doesn't override the terrain, the, the core rulebook re terrain restriction. So you're still impacted by that. You cannot drop out of spore assist. You can't uh, embark fortifications now. Drop six pyrovores. I mean, that's not too bad. The problem is that the pyrovore, like the long range gun on the pyrovores, the one that you're most likely to get shot in, sh uh, get shots with, is um, only strength 4 AP1, which is less exciting. Although, I do like the idea of dropping six power wars. Can you drop pod a drop pod? I imagine that it says non tyrannocyte <laughs> I believe the other one does. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> you can drop hive guard into the trash, <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, chats. So that's it. Now, uh, we didn't cover the Spore Mine data sheets. I think uh, they are uh, some additional data sheets that they came in very small, so <laughs> I don't have a good copy of those to talk about, unfortunately. Um, again, there are some monster or some units that were in the previous version that people have been missing. Stuff like Red Terror has not shown up yet, so whether or not Red Terror is still in the Codex or is gone forever, we don't 100% know, but I think there's a non-zero chance that the poor Red Terror has been removed. The Tyrannocyte profile does not say it can't drop another Tyrannocyte. Incredible. <laughs> can we can we uh, Russian nesting doll ten Tyrannocytes into our into our army? Um. Yeah, the Jormungandr drops turn one. Is that the, is that the case?
No, the Jormungandr does not drop turn one. Yeah, the Jormungandr just gives you normal deep strike. Yeah, that's oh yeah, that's true, chat. Yeah, you're, yeah, Red Terror is not in the point section either. She would be in Elite or Fast Attack. No, nothing. Poor Red Terror, but that's okay. It was a fine cast model anyway, with weird rules that nobody really cares about. Unfortunate, but it is what it is. Melchior, keep buying a Hive Guard unit. You couldn't be bothered to paint. You could just turn him into a Tyrant Guard. There you go. We figured it out. Three Tyrant Guards, I think, what you want for the most part. Uh, all right. Well, Brandon Carver asked a question uh, ages ago. We'll go ahead and, and s circle back to that. Uh, what are some must acute, must include, uh, not build around units? So I think the must includes, for uh, in my opinion, are the Neurothrope. Again, you want to, you know, your stuff doesn't, it, it has kind of a mediocre threat range unless you're advancing and charging. So in my opinion, you have to be able to get Onslaught off with 100% certainty. In the current incarnation of the codex you can get away without onslaughting because you can move a unit see if you onslaught then double move them and if you onslaught you can advance and then you can try to get the the maximum there so there are situations where you're like i have to cast you know i have to go to move twice with two advances so i have to cast onslaught and that's very that's that's super scary in this version once you Go to your chart, you know, once you, you go to cast the Onslaught, your unit has already advanced because it doesn't get a second move. So if you fail that Onslaught, you've now committed all of your buffs and a whole unit for nothing. And that can immediately end the game. So in my opinion, the Neurothrope is probably the number one uh, most important include just because of the ability to uh, uh, um, almost automatically cast your Psychic Powers. That's a pretty good, uh, that's a pretty big one. Um, I like Swarm Lord. I don't, I don't know if he would be an auto include, but objective secured or double obsec plus full rerolls feels very strong to me. Tyranid Warriors, I think, are another one. Um, they may be fighting for a spot with Raveners because they both kind of do the same thing. Tyranid Warriors uh, can be built to do a little bit more damage, I think, because they have um, Toxin Sacks and Adrenal Glands available to them, but they're significantly less fast than, Tyranid, than Raveners. In the list I build so far, I have one of each. And on the Raveners, like go in first, and then they die, and then the Tyranid Warriors kind of mop up. Um, so I would say Neurothropes are the number one, probably Warriors, and at the very least, Warriors as your, uh, Battalion fillers, because they're equivalent points to the other troops options, and they have, uh, Synapse, so they can push your Synaptic Links around. Um, the other ones, I would say, would be Zoanthropes, because they give the whole army an invulnerable save for one turn, which is a very, pretty big deal. And again, they can be, they, you know, they do mortal wounds, and they can be buffed and stuff. And then Exocrines would be the last one. I would say. Um, where does Harry Dan stand? That's a good question, chat. Harry Dan. So he is not core, which is unfortunate for him because he doesn't get any of the cool rerolls and stuff. Uh, we also, I mean, we saw that uh, pathogenic slime was gone, right? Or it was, it's different now. It's a gene rot might effect. It's no longer plus one damage. Um, Bioweapon Bond is gone, so plus one, or <laughs> theoretically, is gone. Uh, I, I, I would assume that the original Synaptic Link abilities are gone. This codex looks totally different if those, if those Synaptic Link abilities are also available. I would uh, almost 100% imagine that they're not. Uh, so, I think Harry Dan's life is dependent on, um, hit on the supplements right now, which sort of dovetails into your next question. But, you can sort of shore up his weaknesses with the synaptic imperative abilities you can give him exploding sixes to hit you can tesla his sixes to hit um you can you can kind of try to play around that stuff you can give him a four plus a vulnerable save where uh he can't be dermic normally but if those supplements aren't available to him i i don't think harry dane is particularly good that said uh there is a very good stratagem for him in this uh in this supplement right here and that is uh, Encircle the Prey, because you can just use it for one CP on a fly unit, and it returns to, uh, just goes back in reserve. So you can just do the gargoyle thing, but you do, do, you do it on a whole Harridan, and you can do it top of one. 
So you can, you know, go up with the Harridan, you do a little bit less damage, but then he bounces for one CP and takes nothing in return and then comes back and does it again. Uh, and then you can potentially, assuming Overrun gets fixed, you could potentially be um, chaining it with Overrun, right? So you encircle, come back, because you didn't come out of Strategic Reserve. I don't know exactly how this works, because I think you have to come back in Airborne. But assuming you don't, you then charge and Overrun a back away again. Um, so you could cycle him off the table for a while. It's significantly less consistent than the current version, which is like put a bunch of buffs on Harry Dan, blood, watch him blow up your opponent's entire army. It's unfortunate. But we'll see if he gets any updates in the new thing. I, I don't know if it would, uh, if uh, he's going to be super duper strong. Um, last part of the question, if both supplements are null, what tier would I put the codex in? So I would call it a solid... A-ish tier codex. So, like, if we consider that Adeptus Custodes, so it's like Tau at the top, maybe Harlequins are fighting with them, or Harlequins are top or above that, or Craftwood Elder or whatever. Uh, and then Custodes are one step below that. We are probably in the step below Custodes. Previously, we were kind of the Crusher Stampede variety um, is sort of budding with custodies because they're very similar lists and they do a similar thing and they kind of they kind of fight each other really well custodies sometimes beat crusher stampede but crusher stampede is probably like a 60 40 or 70 30 into custodies and then loses to the other stuff at the very top of the list there is a potential for Tyrians to be a hard or, or not a card counter but a uh, a meta counter to harlequins because they do have a lot of stuff that doesn't really require them to hit people um they have you know mortal wounds on charges they have pyrovorce potentially out the wazoo they have a lot of flamethrower effects so they could kind of jump up a little bit, but I don't see them being stronger than Tau. Uh, and I think they're kind of on... They they can maybe still fight Custodes. It's a much harder fight than it was previously. Um, but I don't think they fight Tau, and I doubt that they fight the higher levels. So I think that they're solid, like, sort of top of A tier. Um, it feels to me like they're going to struggle against the, the, the super-duper hardcore stuff, but against the more balanced codexes they're probably going to be much much more uh they're, they're going to be better than them i think that is uh, supplements assuming the supplements are all discontinued if you have both crusher stampede and leviathan this codex is probably one of the best um if you have just leviathan i think the codex is probably equal to or better than custodies that would be my interpretation of the situation if you lose just Leviathan, I have no idea. That's kind of weird. That would be a weird situation. Yeah, I think uh, if you just have Crusher Stampede, like, Carnifex Spam becomes, like, the, the name of the game, I guess. Um, and But your Mortal Wound output also, like, is through the roof. Because your monsters start doing extra Mortal Wounds, like, because you have a lot of uh, Psychic Powers dealing Mortal Wounds. But then also you have the core rulebook, or the core Codex stratagem to deal Mortal Wounds on the charge. And you can combo that with Breaking Through. Like, the, the output is insane. Um, plus, you can start, like, defensive buffing Hyrule Duels. I don't know. I didn't really talk about the Forge World stuff. I, I do wonder... I guess the Forge World stuff, I mean, we need to see updates to it, right? But assuming that the Forge World stuff gets all the, the appropriate updates and doesn't break anything, which, who knows, um, they will... You know, you'll be able to give, like, 4 plus invulnerable saves and stuff to, to uh, Hyrule Duels with Zone Thropes and stuff, which is freaking sweet. Uh, where's the Malanthrope? Malanthrope's in Forge World chat. Harry Dance off the Forge World website? Oh, no. Uh, Amateur Thatcher. Oh. Sis Emma said to be next. Besides them, what Sis do you think the next codex should be or will be? As a core demons player, I'm hoping for the demons. Um, I heard, and, and based on, I, I believe this to be true based on the, um, uh, the trailer the january trailer that we got i heard that chaos knights are if not the next in the pipeline like part of the next pair in the pipeline uh probably the release cycle after that so i think chaos space marines are probably a pretty good bet because of all the new the, like the new support that they've gotten and it's just 
it's probably like supply chain logistical weirdness that they haven't been updated with a new codex yet. But uh, I, I think Chaos Knights are, are somewhere around the corner. Uh, let's see. Apocalypse Plant. Am I afraid that the codex is way too good? No, absolutely not. Um, I think if all of the if every supplement remains viable, maybe. But this this codex is like so much less of a point and click adventure game than the previous one. Like there were so many matchups, right, with the previous codex, codex where that were decided by like put buffs on Hive Guard, exploding sixes, double shoot, win, and then that was it. That was the whole game. And this codex doesn't have that. Uh, the shooting is. More Would you throw me a loose list? Some rough ideas you're tossing around. Uh, yeah, we can do this actually. Um, but uh, like the the uh, the ranged attacks in the list are significantly less powerful than they were. Um, the okay, here we go. Um, it's it's like all melee attacks all the time, basically. Like you have exocrines to do uh to do your ranged attacks, and then that's basically it. All right, so here's we were doing we were building these lists in um on Twitch chat today, earlier today. Uh, unfortunately, at the time when we were building them, it had not yet been revealed that uh you could only you could only take one hive tyrant per detachment. So we were assuming you could take two hive tyrants. Uh, which was a little bit wrong. So here's one that I built. Uh, so I cut a second high tyrant out of this. I think you could turn this into double patrol easily and then take two hive tyrants. Um, so I guess the difference was that we had a hive tyrant here and it, it had enraged reserves because again, we weren't sure if you could take um, synaptic or uh, uh, what do you call them? What are those things? Adaptive physiologies on characters. Uh, but we assumed that you could. So we put uh, enraged reserves on that guy, which is the uh, double wins for bracketing, and you get a stratagem for free once per game. Um, so this one's very much focused about around warriors and stuff. Uh, somebody was asking about uh, biocannon warriors, and I think the biocannon warriors are, are pretty solid because the biocannon, the venom cannons are only five points apiece, and you get like a big gun to put on that unit, which is pretty cool. Uh, so basically, we're, we're going to be trying to. We have the, the Tyrant Guard combo with the Swarm Lord and the Winged Tide Tyrant. They're going to be sort of chilling around in the back and, and threatening people. And then we're going to be rocketing Warriors and, and Gene Steelers at people. Uh, excuse me, Warriors and uh, Raveners at people to, like, fight over the midboard and then trying to close out the game with the Hive Tyrants from there. Um, this is kind of a Tyranid good stuff. Like, it's just sort of a little bit of everything. This one is a little bit more focused. Um, again, it probably turns into Double Patrol to fit the second Hive Tyrant in. Or you just cut the second Hive Tyrant entirely. Um, but this one is all Screamer Killers all day. So you could cut this guy for a, I don't know. It's a good HQ choice. This one also doesn't have Hive Guard in, or a Tyrant Guard, excuse me, so far. So the Swarm Lord has to play a little bit cagey, or otherwise he gets shot by Laser Cannon and dies. Um, you could take just a regular Tyranid Prime. I don't know. We could take two Neurothropes, actually, which is probably fine. I bet I bet double Neurothrope is actually pretty good. They're just so good at casting Psychic Powers. Like, a Neurothrope just standing by itself not doing anything is two casts at plus one with 3d6 drop the lowest. Um, and then this one has... How many points are we at? Mm -mm, 1750. So you could do, like, this... And interestingly, this one doesn't use relics very well, which is kind of funny. Uh, take a second exocrine. Maybe we cut the pyrovore for a second exocrine. Because we're kind of all in on monsters, this list. Oh, that's too many heavy support, because we have two screamer killers in heavy support. Just kidding. So it would be, I guess, uh... How many are we got here? 1820. So we have 170 or 180 left. Yeah, I don't know. A bunch of power boards, maybe. So the reason that you, um, 
it's a question mark whether or not you can put the uh, adaptives on a character. Is that in one place it, it says you can't put them on character units, and in another place it says you can't put them on named character units. Um, so it's inconsistent. What it will probably end up being is no characters in the beginning, and then three weeks later they'll realize that they fucked up and they'll errata it, so you can take them. But unfortunately, I think it like kills Trigon Primes and some some type tyrant builds and stuff currently. Carnifex spam won't be a thing because they are too expensive. I don't think that's the case. For 125 points, the Carnifex is a hell of a profile. So if Leviathan remained legal chant, um, it wouldn't be... It wouldn't have two rule sets. Because the... Leviathan Supplement doesn't include any of the sub-faction abilities. The Leviathan Supplement just adds additional abilities on top of the ones from the core rulebook. Um, so it's, yeah, it's not, it would be no different, essentially. Do we talk about Bone Mace on a regular Carnifex? Uh, I don't think so. The regular Carnifex can take the tail upgrades, but the um, Screamer Killer can't, unfortunately, which is a little bit funky. It's weird, like, which upgrades they decided to give each of the the um, the guys. So the regular Carnifex can make a bunch of attacks with the three damage, uh, the three damage Scything Talon. You can al you could alternatively take Crushing Claws, which the Screamer Killer doesn't have access to, and then it also has access to the Bone Mace, which is Strength Seven Two Damage. I, I kind of feel like the Thresher Scythe is actually better because you're going to be trying to full reroll this guy when you, you send him in, if you're if you're building the melee profile specifically. And so having four one damage attacks with full rerolls actually feels a little bit more impactful than having one two damage attack, but I don't really know. Yeah, it's like, so like, Dread Spam was a thing, right, with Wolf and Dreadnoughts, which admittedly had a pretty good gun. It's significantly better than the current, than the Screamer Killer gun, if we compare the two exactly. Um, because it was, he had, they had two Heavy Flamers, right? And they had a 4-plus Invulnerable save. But their melee weapon was equivalent. The Screamer Killer instead has twice as many attacks and threats, like, seven more inches for ten less points. And you you would take you saw Wolf and Dreadnoughts taken for like a year and a half. And this thing is gonna have it has a better armor save. It's gonna have, for the most part, a roughly equivalent invulnerable save because the turn that matters they're gonna have a four plus. And then you can target them with a four plus later on if you want to with the, the psychic power. Um, and you don't necessarily need to have a good invulnerable save all the time because you have that two plus armor. So I think the, like the comparison is very apt between uh, like a, a Wolf Dreads list and a Carnifex spam list, and I think the Carnifex has come out on top in that kind of arithmetic, Just especially because um, in the current version, more attacks is more valuable right now just because of the kind of profiles you're fighting against. Like a Screamer Killer Carnifex going into a Tau Battlesuit unit will just eviscerate it, whereas like a Wolf and Dreadnought will kill the drones and then die. But that's because the Screamer Killer has literally twice as many attacks as a Wolf and Dreadnought. I don't think it's worth it for the Toxin Sacks, though, chap. Um, you're trying to full reroll your wound rolls, and the Toxin Sacks are like 10 more points for a unit you're trying to keep cheap and, and trade with. Uh, is the orc, is there codex creep for this codex? I think there's a little bit. Um, at least from my initial impression, it doesn't, it feels very good, but it, it feels like kind of a, I don't know. It's so much of a side grade. Like the melee in this codex is so much better than the previous version. Like Tyranids now are fucking terrifying in melee. They will absolutely kill the hell out of you. 
but and they're much tougher to kill but their threat range is like halved their ranged pro like their shooting phase sucks Exocrines are like the only appreciable gun in the entire codex besides like random stuff on warriors and things which is fine like shooting 27 attacks out of a warrior you know with full rerolls and exploding sixes and like plus one ap and stuff like that's all good it's not bad but it's not, you know, double hive guard plus double exocrine, you know, plus a harridan, you know, <laughs> like the previous, you could build a tier in the list previously that would just literally shoot the pants of your opponent one turn. And you can't do that anymore. Their shooting, their shooting phase is significantly less powerful. Their shooting phase is mostly there to force your opponent to keep their head down. It's like a suppressive fire. Well, there, the our other stuff just sticks the middle of the table. Um... So I wouldn't say that this like codex is significantly better than the previous version. Uh, are exocrines more important to include than they were before? Yeah, I mean, I would not play an exoc. I, I would in the eighth edition version. I would not touch. I would not uh, touch an exocrine with a ten foot pole. But in this, I think you have to play them. Uh, I do kind of like the base Carnifex Quad Devourer chat, but only for, for the specifically for the reason that it has the core keyword. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't do anything like fun with it. Uh, but being able to shoot 24 shots with full rerolls like to hit is pretty okay. Um, especially because you can take like the synaptic augment to ignore and move or advance and shoot penalties or do the um, sixes to wound our AP1. So they actually gets an AP value on it. So... Uh, I think that there's, like, some play there. Right now, you're talking about shooting, at, like, Tau Battle Suits and, like, Star Weavers and, uh, frickin', um, Custodians with that gun, though, and that gun's gonna do nothing. But if we run into a situation where it's all, like, Harlequin player troops running around, that dude shooting 24 shots is gonna be pretty solid. Um, so the bone mace, you can't attack with the bone mace chat. I think you might be getting a little confused. The bone mace, it makes it single attack and then t shuts off. So you can't take a bone mace like to back yourself up in melee. It just gives you that one extra attack. So. I don't know. We'd have to see it played out. I mean, maybe Carnifexes with uh, Venom Cannons is the way. And we just start seeing like mass venom cannons going with uh, re rolls on from Leviathan or something. Like, I don't know. I, I I guess I haven't quite yet internalized how powerful a four damage gun is, and it it's probably pretty good. Like, there's a non-zero chance a Carnifex shoots another Carnifex and it dies. Yeah, get good chat. Read rules. Uh, am I still thinking of using any Forge World monsters, Hyrules or Demacrons? Um. So right now they don't have the correct keywords. Like I'm sure that I'm sure that you they they will. Um, but what keywords they elect to give them is a big question mark. I would probably still play high rules to be fair. Um, if sides high rules say the same point cost, they're they're probably still very competitive. Barb high is less good because you can't buff them anyway anymore. You can give them exploding sixes for one turn and that's like it. Whereas uh, an Exocrine shoots... An Exocrine now legitimately shoots harder for less points. So I think you would just take Exocrines if you were taking... Instead of Barbed Tyrodils. But side Tyrodils do, like, pull their weight. Yeah, Venom Cannon and Scything Talons for the Carnifex build. That's the classic build, right? I think that's probably pretty good. It's not, like, as fire and forget as Creamer Killers are. Um, and I like the Screamer Killer because it's a more, uh, it's a more efficient use of your buffs. Like, if I want to be putting Voracious Appetite on something, I want to be the putting Voracious Appetite on the thing that attacks 14 times instead of the thing that attacks 7 times. But, uh, a Carnifex in melee with, you know, just punching somebody with a bunch of Scything Talent attacks is probably pretty good. Sanguinarius Fiala Codex is Sisters of Battle at release level compared to Drukari Admech. Uh, that's probably the case, yeah. Like, it'll be really strong in the hands of people who are really good. Um, but I don't think it holds a candle to, like, Tau. Like, you line this army up against a Tau army, and short of, like, the, the, the like, triple patrol hive tyrant list where you can't be shot by anything, um, 
which I'm not even convinced is going to be like that powerful. The a tower army just kills you. Like it just picks you apart. Uh, but that's okay. Town needs to get nerfed. So I think, uh, I think, you know, once this, once the other, especially Tau, I think this, like you can fight custodians with this army and it's probably fine. But, um, especially Tau, Tau need to, Tau need to get taken down like six pegs. And then I think it's an interesting game. Uh, what breaks if you take cult? That's, I think it's just the hyper adaptation ability. Let me take a look here. Um, um, so actually, I think your sub faction bonus breaks if you take anything outside Tyranids. Which is interesting. Um, unlike other abilities, it do it doesn't check your detachment. It checks your whole army, so you lose your entire sub faction. It looks like. So soup armies might be kind of dead, to be honest. I don't I don't know what you would be souping for in Tyranids that GSC doesn't already do, though. To be fair, like it used to be that you would soup for like I guess maybe Exocrines. But you can, like, take Ridge Runners and stuff. I don't know. What's the best lookout scout for Hiveguard? Uh, it's just, like, Warriors, probably. It's just... Uh, you, Hiveguard are... The, the, the paradigm of Hiveguard have shifted... Uh, from being something that forces your opponent into engagement uh, to be something that fights your like fights your the, your opponent's units in the middle from a position of safety. Um, so it's not like you're because their range is so short. You're not going to be like looking for places to like get spotters into their deployment zone and see them. You're looking for things that are in the range in the middle of the table to attack. Um, which means that like your whole army will be able to see whatever you're shooting at. It's just the hive guard will be able to hide while they do it. Uh, yeah, we talked about the um, Kunak kick. We did talk about the uh, hive tyrant being able to take two venom cannons. We did that. Hive Guard are terrible, except Shock Cannons in a Nightmare. Well, well, I think they're also still terrible then, to be fair. <laughs> uh, what is the Massive Swarm rule? The, um... The Swarming Masses? The, uh... Extra Melee rule? Is that what it's called? It's on the little guys. Where are they at? Come here, little guys. Yeah, swarming masses. Uh, it lets you. So right now it doesn't. It does nothing. Um, it theoretically lets you attack two and a half inches away. Uh, in, you know, enemies in a unit you're engaged with that's two and a half inches away instead of one inch or half an inch of half an inch. Um, but right now it doesn't do anything. It needs an errata, essentially. Yeah, it is a uh, unfortunate about impaler cans and stuff. All right, chat. Well, I think we are roll we're uh, ramping up our our discussion here, but I really appreciate everybody coming on. We had a I think we had almost a thousand people in the chat for a while there, which is certainly the biggest that I've had in a while, which is super cool. Thanks everybody for watching. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed this uh, this peek at the Tyranid Codex. Obviously not 100% here, but I'm very excited to play this Tyranid Codex. I, I do think that it feels it feels cohesive, which I like. You know, I, I, I can visualize a game plan and, and whether or not I'm 100 percent accurate on that, I don't know. But I think that, you know, generally speaking, having these like relatively powerful utility models, being able to fo like funnel their buffs onto a unit and you give the unit advance and charge and you buff its attacks and you make it do a bunch of things and it goes in and blows something up. Uh, while the rest of your army is also sort of just generically efficient at attacking and gets the fight over the middle of the table. I think that is very cool and I'm very excited for it. Um, Things could change, obviously. Maybe I we've weighted different units wrong and stuff like that, but 
uh, I am psyched to uh, to be playing some games with it. Um, yeah, yeah. The the problem is the um, with the swarming masses rule. The there are two components to attacking in the fight phase. Just as a, a, a sort of quick um, explanation here. Uh, the first component is that you are, you as a, well, I guess there's three. First of all, your unit has to be in the engagement range of an enemy. So you have to be within one inch of an enemy unit. Um, then your model has to be able to fight, which means that it is normally within an inch of the enemy or within half an inch of half an inch. In the case of the Swarming Masses rule, that extends that range to 2.5 inches. So it activates those models to make their attacks. Then that model goes in, elect, selects targets with its attacks, which is still restricted to one inch of an enemy or half an inch of, of half an inch of a friendly. The targeting, like the ability to target units, is not extended by Swarming Masses. Just the ability to attack. It's it's a it's an idiosyncrasy of the core rules that splits the targeting sequence into two parts that have the same re prerequisites, but Swarming Masses only buffs the range of one half of the of the prerequisite to attack. So you can attack with those units, you just can't attack anything that the Swarming Masses rule says you can. It's very stupid. Uh, it's very it's very stupid in a bad world. Uh, there, I mean, there's a lot of issues with this rule. And and to be fair, like I guess if we if we were to create you know to go on a, a short rant, I guess uh, we've been seeing these problems with a lot of recent codexes. Like for example, the Craftworld Eldar Codex cannot legally take Phoenix Lords without breaking all of their super faction abilities, which is ludicrous. And that hasn't been changed in almost a month. Um, the Tau Codex still can't take out of faction ethereals, despite the fact they have a rule that they can. If they do, they don't get a tactical philosophy. That's ridiculous. And it's these little stupid nitpicky garbage things that you can't go to a tournament and say, I'm gonna ignore that. And so I hope my opponent doesn't doesn't realize. Um, that or they're finding their way into all of these books and nobody's fixing them for months and months and months. If they fix them in a reasonable time frame, that would be fine. But they don't, and they're still here and it's obnoxious as hell. And this book includes some, uh, like several of them. One of which being whether or not named characters or whether or not characters can take adaptive physiologies. One place says they can, one place says they can't. Uh, the overend stratagem doesn't work. The swarming masses ability doesn't work. And those need to be updated. Uh, the, the, does the neurothrope ability unlock zone thropes or neurothropes in additional slots? I don't know. Um, and I can't make a ruling on that because it goes either way. And the level of quality of these codexes is dropping sharply. Now, there is, a, like I said at the top of the video, there, there's a non-zero chance that this is a pre-print um, copy of the Codex, and it's not 100% like that, and some of these issues have been fixed, but we'll just have to wait till next month to find out. Farsight can't use his command ability. Michael Enright, good, an excellent example. Technically, Farsight can't use his command ability. Technically, like, zone thropes don't project their own synaptic thing because they forgot to put the synapse keyword on. Like, it's stupid shit that somebody should have caught. But they don't because Games Workshop has no fucking semblance of, of, of quality control. It's dumb. Um, yeah, we talked about the Tyrion secondary where you're six inches away to, to start the action, but then if you stay at six inches, the action fails because you can't place your token down there. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to take a nap now because I've been talking all day. But thanks, everybody, for watching. Um, thanks for everybody who dropped super chats and support in the channel. Please tune in on Thursday. I'll put up a, a, uh, a listing for it right after this video. So if you, I'll, I'll put it on the community page. So if you go check that out, please tune in to Throwdown Thursday. I'm going to be playing Colin again. He's probably going to be playing new Eldar. I'm going to be playing this new Tyranid Codex. And uh, we're going to do some in-person live streaming gaming. Please come hang out and chat with us and watch that game. It's going to be awesome. Uh, I'll probably dig out a bunch of old dusty screamer killers and we'll play some Carnifex spam. It's going to be freaking sick. And uh, yeah, anyway, I'll see you there. Hopefully. I hope I do. Otherwise, I'll be very sad. And remember to keep it classy, folks. And 